Baka 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 all praises. Thank you for that. All praises. Hallelujah. Anyone else? All praises to the Most High. Can you hear me? Um, all praises. I just want to thank the Most High uh, for dreams and um, protection. I had a dream last night, uh, and, I, and I woke up this morning and told my husband that I um, had a dream that I walked, in, I walked into the Baya, and we had about 30, 40 people in the Baya, and most of them were familiar faces. Uh, friends and family that I know and just did my heart good. I had to run out and try to make more food. <laughs> it was so comical, but it was it, when I woke up, I felt good. It was like familiar faces in the bio. So I say that to let you know that coming soon, I'm going to sit down and we're going to think of uh, pick a date so we can do the friends and family day. It's important that our family hears this message. It's impo important that our family knows, because uh, I believe a lot of times they think we're talking in riddles, because they, they have no clue and they're so lost. So all praises to the Most High for dreams and, and, and visions. That, and, and not saying that it's from the Most High, but wow. I, I feel like it was telling me something. So just all praises. Hallelujah. 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 He promised to do that. that that's, that's him keeping his word. We may not get all. He doesn't do everything at once. So this may be a stage where you get the dream back. And then the gift of the interpretation may come later. Or may come by somebody else. That's how he, the father is. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody else? Any praise reports? <laughs> So I want to give all honor and glory to the Most High. Say, Kaya, Dala, Yahawabah, Sham, Yahawashad, Malak, Mabah. So, you know, I don't take none of these days for granted. I don't take none of you for granted being Bereans, helping us. Uh, you guys don't know, just even the people on Facebook that I have never met before, they, they keep me going knowing that it's other people seeing this stuff. There's other people. Go ahead, y'all turn it down. There's other Israelites, right? Some of them righteous, you know, some of them may not be righteous. But all of us being Bereans, not being gullible, just believing uh, anything on YouTube, like they try to uh, put that on us. Like we all done going with the YouTube University and we done got caught a uh, code of some kind of code. No, it's, it's righteous brothers and sisters listening reading these verses like oh my goodness like all praises the most high is you know waking us up so it feels good to deceive each and every one of you being Bereans holding on to this truth because if you make it past a year that's something to celebrate about because you know when you find out something new it's a fad and it's exciting I'm, I'm learning Hebrew words I'm learning uh, I'm wearing new garments but when your family cuts you off, when the job is telling you you gotta go or you can't wear that, that's that's when the rubber meets the road. So I'm encouraged by each and every one of you. I'm encouraged by the assemblies online, and I just I'm at a um, I'm at a level, family. I don't care how it goes down. I, I don't. As long as you know, me and my wife got something to eat, we got clothes on our backs. I'm okay with how it goes down. So. I think the most high for each and every one of you um, making the efforts, making the sacrifices to keep his law, statutes, commandments. And I want to thank the most high for each and every assembly uh, throughout the four corners that's gathered today under the name of uh, Hamashiach. We call him Yahweh Shai, uh, whatever you call him, Yahushua, Yehoshua. We praise the most high that he blessed each and every assembly today. Um, if all hearts and minds were clear, uh, we're going to go into today's class. I don't want to shortchange anyone. If you want to offer a praise report, you can do so at, at this time. Praise Yah. Shalom, family. Shalom. Uh, first and foremost, I want to give praise, honor, esteem, glory, and just thanks to the Most High Yah in the name of Yahweh Shai Hamashayat, for who is good and his mercy endures forever. Uh, just thanks for another day of life, mercy another Shabbat being able to come and honor him the best way we know how. 
uh, and, and for the things that are known and unknown, explained and not explained. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because a few days ago, when me and Shamar were on our way from the Bayat, we were talking and I was just looking out the window and it's now remember, Mara, it was dark outside. Well, well, Next well, thing you well, know, Friday night. This Tuesday was night. Tuesday night. Uh, Tuesday night. Tuesday oh, night. Uh, Tuesday oh, night. Uh, so um, I'm looking, I'm just staring off out the window as Shamar is talking. Next thing you know, pitch black now. I see something in the sky and it's red and it's shining. It's not the sun <laughs> or the moon. And what Shamar is, is my witness. And it looked like a, it kind of looked like a, like a shark fin or like a kite or something red and it was bright. And I, you know, just making sure I wasn't tripping. I said, what is that? And Shamar looked and he almost had to stop the car. Mm -hmm. So, wow. you know, we, to this, we don't know what it was, but I praise y'all anyway, just because he said it's going to be signs in the heavens. <laughs> so, uh -huh. uh, you know, I just wanted to say that. And if anybody's seen anything or know anything, you read something on the news, you know, just just bring it to our attention because we really to this to never seen anything like that before. I'm telling y'all, it wasn't just like a because you know sometimes you might see some streak across the sky or you know like man, did I really see that? No, nah, it was out there. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that. Oh, did y'all get a picture or video? We was driving. Oh, he was driving. Yeah, like, uh, he, yeah, I forgot <laughs> about that. But he's absolutely right because he said, what is that? And then I looked through his window and I said, what is that? <laughs> and I stopped, I saw it slowing down, but it, it looked like a, almost like a red top of a mountain or triangle or some type of, like he said, a shark fin. It was some type of triangular red looking thing in the sky and it was nighttime, it was pitch black. So it wasn't like a cloud, the sun wasn't out. I, we had got no clue what it was, but he said, man, I'm just so happy that you saw it. So I'm not tripping, but yeah, he's right. And I was like, man, we just kept looking at just saying, what was that? And it was no, we couldn't see it from anywhere else but that one area that we drove past it wasn't like when we went to the house we could see it in the sky or anything it was just that one spot and we saw i mean for what i saw i said i told him i said it looked like some type of top mountain peak or triangle but it was like pure red in the sky so i don't know what i don't know wow all praises all praises when, when that stuff happens, I, I know it's hard when you, if you're driving, but try to um, use your app to see what direction it's in. And uh, that's why these, these, it was in the east? Um, yeah, we, we was driving this way, and it was over here. That's, that's the west. It was, the, it was in the west from, on that, from that side. Yeah, that, the east. Yeah, the east would have been this way. Right. The west was that way. That, that's what it's good. That's why it's good to have these journals, especially, like I said, the, the moon journals, to write what you see and, and the, the direction and the time. Because uh, we never know it could be used for something later to give us understanding because it's uh, the most high, um, the luminaries is his billboard. The luminaries is his chalkboard for us. And I'm just jogging my memory. I was reading something this week or looking for something, I was listening to uh, uh, the Bible app this week, and uh, man, what story was it? It was one of the, it was, I think it was an apocrypha, but the, the stars pretty much led them to, oh, oh, the, um, the birth of Messiah, that's what I was studying this week, the birth of Messiah, the men, the men came and said, we saw his star in the east, and the star, if you go back and catch the story, it said the star guided them to where Messiah was. Mm -hmm. That's how they knew when the star stopped, they stopped and knew where, where Messiah was at. And I was like, wow, that's just like the beginning coming out of Egypt, the cloud and the fire led us. So the Most High guides us by his luminaries. Therefore, us, 
It's just that we're so far removed from our culture, we no longer know how to read the stars. So that's why it's good to, to, to get you a log book and start logging these things, because you never know when it's going to come back to be beneficial to us. So all praises to Abba Yah for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if all hearts and minds are clear, let me share my screen. We're going to uh, transition into today's class, and I don't think it's going to be that long, but y'all know we always say that and wind up being here five to six hours, but this is what uh, our Shabbat gathering is for, to get understanding and fellowship, so I definitely don't mind. As long as we got some food and some coffee, I'm, I'm fine. So we've been, we've been um, going over this series of uprooting Christianity. And this series, did y'all lock that door? Was it already locked? I just shut it. I had a lock it for y'all. So um, I locked it from. Oh, yeah, because you had to knock. You had yeah, to but knock. I thought it was. Um, let me just bear it So, this series of uh, uprooting Christianity, it's, it's an ongoing series because there's so many layers to Christianity. And we we're live on Facebook, so we got to put this out there. This will be published to our YouTube channel. Um, speaking of YouTube channel, I uh, want to give the brothers another uh, round of applause for Tuesday night, the premiere of Just Give Me Book. Uh, Shamar Yandaraya did a wonderful job. But the spirit was uh, just in here. Uh, I got the replay posted to the YouTube channel, and the message was clear. It was concise and it was according to the plumb line. I produced witnesses. Naraya and myself helped corroborate with even more witnesses. So if you haven't had a chance, uh, go check out the YouTube channel. Uh, it's episode 141, 144-1, What is Christianity on the YouTube channel. And also, if you haven't had a chance, I didn't publish, I did clip the, um, the segment where we cut the Bible out. But for those on, on Facebook right now, we actually cut this Bible out Tuesday night. And what we did, family, we went through this Bible, and every, every pretty much every uh, book that mentions about the law, we cut it out, and this is all we was left with. Two, two covers, a front, a front back cover, and the tables of weights and measurements, and, and the concordance. And we did this to show our family and friends in Christianity that when your pastor tells you that you are to live by faith and grace alone, that the law can't save you, when you take the law outside of the Most High's word, you're left with a front and back cover and a table of weights and measures. So I got the, the clip already ready to go. I'll probably upload it sometime this week to the Facebook channel. And that's another talking point for your family and friends, or just to be another witness, help us get the word out. When you take the Most High's law out of the Bible, you don't have a Bible. I say that again for the people in the back. When you take the Most High's law out of the Bible and tell people that you are living by grace and that you're under grace, you don't have a Bible. Because from cover to cover, even the New Testament, all the apostles are, are upholding the law. All the apostles are reminding us to hold fast to the covenant. And covenant is a metaphor. Covenant is a Hebrewism for the laws, statutes, and commandments. Even Apostle Paul, he directly told people that he, with his heart, with his mind, he upholds the law of God, but his flesh has some following the law of sin. So I get that clip uploaded for everyone, but when you take the law out of the Bible, you don't have a Bible. You have two covers and a concordance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So back to today's topic, we're continuing with uh, uprooting Christianity, and this is not a, a, a dig. We're not trying to embarrass no pastor. We're trying to save our family. We're trying to save our family and friends who we love, who's following Christianity, whether by default, that's all mom and dad did, that's all grandma did, or they've been indoctrinated and they really believe that Christianity 
is the way to heaven. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to show them that Christianity is not the way to heaven. Christianity is not what Messiah was teaching. And Christianity is not what the apostles were teaching. So we're going to continue today with textual criticism. So this is textual criticism part two. Textual criticism part two. And we all know textual criticism, it sounds like one of those sophisticated words. Oh, he, he went to Harvard. Oh, my, my goodness. He, he really knows something. Textual cri criticism is just common sense. If it's cold outside, you put a coat on. That's common sense. If you read something in a writing that says uh, a, a baby jumped over a car, you're going to be like, uh, either this is fiction or this is a lie. That's textual criticism, family. So we apply textual criticism to our scrolls to detect false doctrine and help show our family how we've been led astray. How many people ever been lied to? Did it feel good when you was lied to? I hate it. You hate it. So I'm going to start. I know I shouldn't do that. Probably going to regret this. I'm going to start with my wife. Um, how many how many lies would it take for you before you say, you know what, I lost faith in this, this person? How many lies? What, what's your lie threshold? I would say it depends on the lie. Okay, it depends on the lie. Depends on so um if it's like a, a white lie, how, how many lies you would take? That's hard. Um, because when once someone continues to lie to you, they show you their integrity. And once their integrity is gone with me, I, I really have no respect for you. So um can't put a number on it, um, but it, it wouldn't take more than uh, uh, one or two, <laughs> at, you know, of little white lies just to know someone's integrity. We're going to say two. You said two, right? Two. So Gina's lie threshold is two. I, what, what, what's your what's your lie threshold? How many lies would it take for you to be like, man, I can't believe nothing this joke is up? Uh, I guess I'd give them some grace, but after one, I'm already, I'm, I'm already, I don't like lies. Like, I, so I, I hate it. So for, for me, I, I guess I, you know, always, you know, give them some grace, forgive them for like one. So I'll probably say uh, two as well. So Shamari, I got two. Those family online, what's your lie, what's your lie threshold? Reg, what's your lie threshold? Say that, say that again. What's your what's your lie threshold? How many lies can you can you uh, accept from a person before you cut them off and no longer have faith in them? Look, don't 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 get me started on that. I'm because I'm tough. Uh, my my heart is soft, but I'm real 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 tough. So I try to be forgiving because how can I how can I say I love God and I and and and, and say I love my brother? I'm a liar, right? If I just don't show real forgiveness, right? Um, mm -hmm. but my lie threshold, because I'm so cerebral, I'm so psychoanalytical, I analyze so much stuff, my lie threshold is almost zero. Like, don't lie to me. Because <laughs> I, I hold myself to, a, to an integrity that, like, I'm not going to lie to you. I just, I just can't, I can't do it. Because I, don't, I want you to be able to trust me, so I need to trust you. Give uh -huh. me, tell me, tell me, tell me. It, it, it's like the saying goes, you, you, you. Fool me once, fool me twice. You know how that goes, but then, then after a while, shame on me. I'm not about to have that shame on me. You got to go. Huh? So Red says he got zero. Like he, he don't zero. have. He has a zero tolerance for lies. Thank you for that, Red. Hey, Chef, Chef, how many? What's your what's your lie tolerance, Chef? How many lies can you accept before you just cut someone off that they can't be trusted? Chef, it gets encrypted. Chef, you, chef, you there? You might be cooking. Naraya, Naraya, how, what's your what's your lie threshold? How many lies can you accept before you can't trust someone? Uh, well, it kind of depends on the gravity of the lie, uh, but I'm, I'm I would side closer to where Shamaria is. You lie to me one time, 
and now I'm looking at you wary and I don't believe a thing that you say. I don't trust the thing that you say. So <laughs> pretty much after that first time, it's gonna have to, you're gonna have to really show me something for me to believe anything or trust anything that you got to even talk about. So I'll say one to two. So it seems like two, most of us, well, most of you have two. Uh, Red's got a zero. Sister Doreen, Gerald's driving. You can speak for both of y'all. What's your lie threshold? How many lies can you accept before you can't trust someone, before you cut them off? Can y'all hear us? Are they still on out? He's on, but he probably can't, can't hear us. He probably can't speak. All right, so I'm pretty much I'm with I'm with the the majority here. I give you know everyone one lie because you know circumstances you know, and then the second one it's like you know that that's who you are that that's your character. So my lie leader my lie threshold is two. I catch you in two lies. I really I don't really want to talk to you no more because like you're wasting my time. I don't want to have to sit and decipher. Which one of these words is a lie? So if I if I catch you on two lies, I'm pretty much done with you. Like you can tell me anything, and I'm listening, but I'm I'm really not listening. When you leave, everything you said is out the window because you were lying to me. So all of us said about two lies is our threshold. Today, what we're gonna do, we're gonna show you the corruptions of the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is what's also known as the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version, as far as the Old Testament, we're just talking about the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, they use the Masoretic tradition or they use the Masoretic translations to make their Bibles. And not only the King James, most of these other Bibles out there that you're spending good money for, they also are still based on the same translation. So you could spend so many dollars, two, three hundred dollars on all these different translations, but most of them are using the same fragments. So most of them have the same adorations. And me and the brothers, we are all collecting lists so we can share with each other. And my list just, uh, I forgot some websites that I found years ago. So last night I went back to one of the websites that I had and my list just, just catapulted up. I forgot a lot of these. So we're going to show you how you just can't open the Bible up and start thinking you get understanding. Now you want to debate people, and now you want to chop people down like you know something. And the warning for this class, this class is not for a newbie. If you just woke up last week or within a year, this class is really not for you. This is a really like a, a high level study. If you're easily swayed and, and you're unsteady in, in, in your studying and, and you're easily, oh, I don't know what to believe, this study may not be for you because I wanna make it clear what we are not doing and what we are not saying. We are not saying that you are not to read the Bible. We are not saying that you are not, that you are to throw the Bible away. The whole point of this textual criticism is to show you, is to push you towards Messiah. This whole episode we're doing on textual criticism is not for you to get all shook and rattled, and I don't know what to believe, and I don't know, I don't know what Bible to read. The point of this is to push you into the arms of Hamashiach, showing you that you can have all kind of intellect, you can have a Harvard degree, Unless Hamashiach starts talking to you and giving you understanding, you're not going to get to the core of what the father was saying to the elders. Because most of us who are really like, we're bookworms when it comes to this Bible, and we, we I got to know, I got to know. I got brothers texting me, I, I need answers, I want answers. If you want the answers that you want, you have to come back to A, the true language of a Hebrew and you have to get to the most pure copy of the text that we have. And what we're going to show you today with the help of Yah, this so-called Masoretic text, this so-called King James, and all the other ones out there, uh, Sefer, 
uh, Schofield, Parallel, ESV, NIV. Most of these translations have been brought to you by non-Israelites who really don't know the culture or the language. Many people think those, um, the, the paleo, the stick figures, they think they can read that, and, and y'all will, and we'll focus on the language next week. But most people think if they can read what I call the stick figures, or I'm reading Hebrew, that's not what reading Hebrew it is. You may, you may be able to pronounce the words, but until you can take the pictures and process what that picture is saying, you really don't understand Hebrew. So the whole purpose of this class, textual criticism, is not to get you to burn your Bible and not to, and to get you to turn away from the Bible. It's to get you to run to Messiah for all your understanding. When you open up the text, pray and repent, and ask Messiah to give you understanding. We have found over 30 errors inside the King James. And what Dr. Seminary would tell you, or someone polished, or someone who's indoctrinated, they're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know we know about those errors, but it was minor stuff. It didn't change the text. It's a lie, and we're going to show you. They changed the text with major things, and we're going to show you. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to read these verses out of the, out of the uh, Masoretic KJV, and I'm going to read it out of the Septuagint, and please write these down, or um, I can send you a copy of the presentation but we're going to go over like 30-something verses to show you how they were altered on purpose and how they're not minor changes. They actually change the content and context of the verse. So the first one we're going to, let's go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. Genesis 49. Now, you got to give me a minute because I'm, I'm working with these Roman numerals. So... Um, I have to, you know, compute what they mean in, in, in English. Uh, that's here we go. So we're going to open up. The first one is Genesis forty-nine, verse ten. Shemaiah is going to read it to you in the Masoretic, also known as the King James. I'm going to read it out of the Septuagint. We already know the Septuagint is a better copy. The Septuagint is the best copy we have. Of our scrolls. Genesis 49, verse 10. Shema. Shema. Read. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. The Septuagint says, A ruler shall not fail from Judah, nor a prince from his loans, until there come the things stored up for him. Y'all see the difference there? With Masoretic text saying a lawgiver shall not depart from Judah's feet, but the original, the authentic text says a ruler shall not depart from his feet, nor a prince from his loans. A ruler is because Judah is the king tribe, and a prince means he's the prince, of, he's the son of David. The original says nothing about a lawgiver. These Masoretes, these Masoretic priests change it on purpose so they can keep control of the text, so they can keep control of the people. Hey, turn the mic up a little bit. Which one are you on? Fire one. Mic check. Mic check, one, two, one, two. So that's the first one. Genesis 49 and 10 has been altered. It's been altered and it changes the text. There's no lawgiver from Judah. The lawgivers come from who family? The Levites. The Levites. The Levites. Let's go to the next one. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. Come on. Exodus 12, 40. Read. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. The Septuagint says, and the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan 
was 430 years. Y'all catch the difference? Canaan. Uh, it's a total, it's an aggregate. But Abraham got to Canaan and our time in Egypt is 430. We didn't spend the whole, the whole 430 in Egypt. It's Egypt and Canaan. That's, this, this one verse has led to so many debates and arguments, and people, the argument will be cut short if they get the Septuagint. So we wasn't in Egypt for 430 years. We were in Egypt and Canaan. We was in Canaan first, and then we spent the rest of the time in Egypt for a total of 430 years. Let's go to the next one, Exodus 21 and verse 8. Exodus 21 and verse 8. And as you guys, if, if you got your subtuition, if you find more, please send them to the group so we can mark our text as well. Please send them to the group so we can mark ours. Exodus 21, verse 8. Well, let me make sure I'm with you. Exodus 21, verse 8. Read. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he have dealt deceitfully with her. Read that again, Aunt. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. The Septuagint says, if she be not pleasing to her master, after she has betrothed herself to him, he shall let her go free. But he is not at liberty to sell her to a foreign nation because he has trifled with her. Did y'all catch the difference? Yeah. He's not, he must not allow to sell her. Read yours again. If he please not her master who have betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he have dealt deceitfully with her. So the Masoretic is trying to make it seem like he can't stop her from being sold to a strange nation. But that's not what the text says. The text says, uh, I'll just read that part of interest, but he is not at liberty to sell her to a foreign nation. So that's kind of confusing, meaning like you can't... I can't stop her from being sold to a foreign nation, but it's saying the most high saying you should not sell her to a foreign nation. You must make sure she's not sold to a foreign nation because now you're going to sell her away from her family. This is all for Hebrew servants. This is the law of Hebrew servant. So the text here, the Septuagint is reading better, and is reading more accurate, is reading in line with the commandments for Hebrew servants. He cannot sell her, or he is not at liberty to sell her to a foreign nation, opposed to the Masoretic saying he has no power to stop her from being sold to a foreign nation. It's a major difference. It's a major difference when these seminary people tell you, yeah, we know about these differences, but they're just minor little words. They don't change the meaning of the text. These first three verses change the meaning of these texts. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. If you have a Septuagint, it's going to be 2 Kings. Second Samuel chapter 6, and we need verse 10. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 10. Shema. Shema. Read. So David would not remove the ark unto you, the ark of Yahweh unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. So the King James says David took the ark and let it go with the Obed Edom, the Gittite. The Septuagint says, and David would not bring in the ark of the covenant of Yah to himself and to the city of David, 
and David turned it aside into the house of Ab Abadara the Gittite. Abadara. Abadara is not Obed Edom. It's two different, it's, it's different letters and it's different and, and it's a different spelling. So Obed Edom and Abadara are two different people. Two different names were listed here. And I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt to say, well, maybe they just spelled it wrong. But Obed Edom is totally different because the word for us for Obed is Ibad. Ibad means a servant or a slave. So the King James says he's Obed Edom. He's a servant from Edom, or he's an Edomite servant. But the text calls him A B E D D A R A. So even if I give them the first half, it says, well, yeah, I, I can see Abad, uh, Abed is a servant. The last part of the name is Dara. You don't get Edom. You don't get Edom. So the, the, the names right there are wrong. The Masoretic text got the wrong name there. And for a cross-reference, let's cross-reference this with 2 Kings. Second, oh, no, that's me. That's me. I'm sorry. That's me. So that's another one. It's two different people listed who, who had the ark. Two different names are listed who, who had the ark. Is it Obed-Edom or is it Abad-Dara? Abad-Dara and Obed-Edom those names don't matter. Even if you try to, to uh, transliterate, it don't, those names don't matter. It's two different people, two different people. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to uh, 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. Again, in the Septuagint is 2 Kings. So already we've passed most of y'all lie threshold. Most of us said we'll give someone two lies. We're up to four lies. We done caught this text in. We're up to four lies already. That's right. That's right. And we got people trying to debate, trying to correct people. And it says it right here. It says it right here. I'm giving you book. I'm giving you scripture. You don't know who translated it. You don't know who changed it. And you don't know the Hebrew. It's not being arid. We're behind enemy lines, family. You have to take all this, all these things into consideration. Uh, 24. You remember that spelling you said for the, the last one? A B E D Dharma. A B E D Dharma. That's why I said I can give them the first half with that a, a, a bag, but Dharma is nothing like Edom. Dara is nothing like Edom, and our ancestors wouldn't misspell Edom because they know we know that they're our cousins. They're Edomites. They're, they're our cousins. Yeah, I had to write it down because you know the newer Septuagint, they still they got that wrong. So uh what's it? 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24 and verse 1. 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. And again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. So the, the Masoretic text is saying that the Most High was mad at David, and the Most High told David to go number Judah, which is a sin. The Septuagint says, and the Most High caused his anger to burn forth again in Israel, and Satan stirred up David against them, saying, go number Israel and Judah. The Most High wouldn't tell David to number Israel, because that's a sin. He told Moses, only count the warriors. But our whole nation, it's a sin, because the Most High says, your seed is going to be like the stars of heaven. So for any of us that says, like these uh, black hats, these European black hats, oh, six million of us perished in the Holocaust. How you know? We, we don't know how many of us perished in, 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 in the transatlantic because these people insured the boats and the people, so they wrote claims. That's how we know how, how many of our ancestors died. But for you black hats with the bangs, you don't, how you know? The most high said the, the, the true seed of Abraham is going to be like the seed of, of the stars of heaven, like the sand of the sea. You don't, you can't number Israel. So 
Why would the Most High tell David to number the children of Israel? He's telling him to go sin. He didn't tell him that. The Most High was upset with, with, with Israel, and Satan creeped in and told David, go number the people. You see the difference there? It's a major difference. Ma major difference. It's funny how they use that number six, too, huh? Six million. Mm. It's a coincidence, huh? Mm. Lies abound upon lies. So already, family, we're up to, what, what was this lie number? Like four, something like that. Uh, four, one, two, three, four, five. We're up to five lies. We're three over our lie threshold. But like Benaiah says, well, wait, there's more. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13 and 12. Isaiah 13 and 12. The whole point of this is to show our brothers and sisters, Christians and Israelites, you cannot just open up the Bible and think that you have understanding. You cannot open up the Bible and call yourself debating or now you want to uh, correct someone when you don't have the, the best copy of the text. Isaiah 13 and verse 12. Isaiah 13, verse 12. Shema. 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 Read. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Okay, maybe I'll put the wrong one because mine is reading the same. No, nah, it's, it's different. I got it. So read, read yours again in the KJV. Oh, I see where it's at. Okay, read it again. I, I, I got it. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. What it really says, this is verse uh, Isaiah 13 and 12 in the Septuagint. And they that are left shall be more precious than gold tried in the fire. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. It's the remnant. It's us. <clears throat> Those that are left those of the remnant, I'm going to make them more precious than gold. Read it again. I, read the corruption. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. So the Septuagint says, and they that are left shall be more precious than gold tried in the fire, and a man shall be more precious than the stone that is in Sophia. You see the difference? Yeah, I, mine, you know, it's a little bit different than yours. It's the same stuff, though. It says, and those left behind will be more valued than unsmelted gold, and a person will be more valued than the stone in no fear. So Tremorda has a different copy of the Septuagint, but you still see it's reading totally different than the corrupted King James. The, Korean, the King James is totally corrupted. This is number six. Already six lies of the KJV, aka six lies of the Mesoretic text. And okay, these are that'll kill your rapture doctrine. Already. Mm -hmm. You see how this is why we go over this because we can show people with love what you're saying is not what the original text says. We, we, and we, not, we haven't even gotten into the language. Next week, y'all will we get into the language. Number seven, Isaiah 19, verse 24. Isaiah 19, verse 24. This is all to push people into the arms of Amashiach. You can't understand what the Father said through the prophets with these translations. Last week, we read an article online from a rabbi. You know, he's a, a Khazar rabbi, but he said a good point. He says, reading these Hebrew Israelite scrolls through translations is like kissing a woman through a veil. No one wants to kiss a woman through the veil. And that's what we're doing with these translations. Isaiah 19, verse 24. Read. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom Yahweh Tazabah shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt. My people and Assyria, the work of my hands, 
and Israel, mine inheritance. Read that again real slow, Ah. In that day, Israel shall be third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom Yahweh Tazabah shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands. Now listen how this really reads in the Septuagint. Isaiah 19, verse 24. In that day shall Israel be third with the Egyptians and the Assyrians, blessed in the land which the Most High of hosts has blessed. Saying, blessed be my people that is in Egypt and that is among the Assyrians and Israel, my inheritance. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. It makes it seem like, see, God loves everybody. He's going to bless the Egyptians mm -hmm. and the Assyrians. Devil is a liar. He says, blessed be my people that is among the Egyptians. Where are we right now, family? Among the We are Egyptians. among the Egyptians. And we are blessed because we're healthy. We'd have been around all these dirty uh, COVID people, and he brought us out. We don't have the best homes, but we still have somewhere to lay our heads at. Every morning I get up, I ride by people living in tents. I said, thank you, God. So this text is corrupted. It's not blessed be the Assyrians and blessed be the Egyptians. Blessed be my people among the Egyptians. Corruption, family. Corruption. Again, those who just tune in, if you catch this later, we're not telling you to throw away your Bible. We're pushing you into the arms of Hamashiach, of the arms of Yahawashai, because Yahawashai says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, my father will love you and I will manifest myself to you. That's John, I believe, uh, 7 and... Um, what was it? John 7 and, and 21, was it? You're not going to get understanding if you're not keeping the law. So we're not telling you to throw your Bibles away. We're telling you to run to the, to the arms of Hamashiach and keep the law. If you're keeping the law and you run to Hamashiach, he's going to give you understanding. He will show you these adorations inside the text. Y'all ready for the next one? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 52 and 3. Isaiah 52 and 3. Isaiah 52, verse 3. Shema? Shema. Shema. Read. For thus saith Yahweh, ye have sold yourselves for naught. And ye shall be redeemed without money. Read that again up. For thus saith Yahweh, ye have sold yourselves for naught. So the King James Mother Ray saying that we sold ourselves for nothing. It really says in the KJ, I mean in a, a Septuagint, for thus saith Yahweh, ye have been sold for naught. Mm -hmm. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. They sold us for nothing, meaning not, not nothing of value, but you sold us for a liquor. You sold us for wheat. So the text says we sold ourselves, but no, Yah says y'all have been bought for nothing. Y'all have been bought for nothing. Oh, oh, you want those horses? Give me two Hebrew slaves. Those, those horses ain't nothing to us. Read yours again, please. In the in Septuagint, it says... Isaiah 52, verse 3. For thus saith Yahweh, ye have been sold for nothing, for naught, and ye shall be ransomed with uh, and ye shall be, and ye shall not be ransomed with silver. Yeah, that's the same thing. And here you were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without silver. It's saying, it's saying like you were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed at that same time cost he's gonna be the redeemer he's not gonna pay any right money he's not giving no money he's gonna lay these nations down right the most high says i'm not coming to these nations and to buy my inheritance back i'm coming to these nations to destroy them and take my inheritance back 
That's what y'all saying. But the, the KJV is corrupt, saying that we sold ourselves. We didn't sell ourselves. We were bought for nothing. We were bought for nothing. They got us cheap. That's what he's saying. But we didn't sell ourselves. They sold us. That's the point we're making. That's number eight. Number nine, Isaiah 16, 11. Isaiah 60, verse 11. We're behind enemy lines. We got to go through all this research and textual criticism to really get what the Father is saying. But this is for, this is for Israelites and Christians. Stop thinking you have understanding. Stop, stop thinking you're some kind of... Uh, uh, world famous guru, Mora, more or rabbi, and you don't even have the original text. Okay. Isaiah 60, verse 11. Read. Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be bought. Read that again, Al. Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may, be, may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. Watch how much better it reads in the, in the Septuagint. Isaiah 60, verse 11. And thy kings, Salakia, and thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night to bring into thee the power of the Gentiles and their kings as captives. Hmm. You see how direct that is? Not only are we going to have the wealth for the Gentiles, but your president, your king, your monarch, whatever you call your leader, he's going to be a slave to Israel. Read it again. Let's compare them again. Huh? Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. And thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night to bring in the, to thee the power of the Gentiles and their kings as captives. It reads totally different. Totally. That Mesoretic text is watered down. God loves everybody and everybody can inherit with Israel. It's a lie. These nations who had us, their kings are going to be our servants their kings are going to be slaves for us. That's what the, that's what Yah is saying. That's not the Torah group. That's not Brother Abayah. That's what does say the Most High Yah, the king of this world. These Gentile kings are going to be our slaves. That's the text. If you have a problem with it, take it up with the great I am. Number 10, Jeremiah 17 and 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Y'all know this one by heart. This is one you see the brothers, they, they chopping people down with this one. They swear they bring some truth with this one. Jeremiah 17 and 9. Come on. This coffee kicking. Y'all ready? <laughs> <laughs> the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. We brought this out before. The heart is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? What did we say was wrong with that family? Why doesn't that make sense? The heart's not deceitful. Heart's not deceitful, right? But how did the Most High tell us to love him? With all, thy heart. with all your heart. Why would the Most High tell me to love him with all my heart, but then he knows my heart's deceitful? These are context clues. Something's wrong with the text. This is what it really says, Jeremiah 17, 9 in the Septuagint. The heart is deep beyond all, and it is the man. And who can know him? The heart is deep beyond all, and it is the man. 
who can know him. Totally different. These are these are not minor changes. These devils, these these mesorites, they changed the text. What does Deuteronomy 4 and 2 says, family? Do not add or take away. Do not add or take away from my word. We're up to 10 alterations, even by these Gentile standards. If this is a work of a scholarship, we just caught you in 10 lies. We should throw this out the window. We should feed this to a pit bull. You can't have understanding with corrupted text. The whole purpose of this exercise is to show the Israelites and the Christians you need Messiah. You need to fast and pray and follow the law. Dr. Seminary, T.D. Jakes, I don't care how many churches y'all pack out. If you're not following the law, Messiah is not going to give you revelation. Let's go to the next one, Jeremiah 22 and 30. Jeremiah 22, verse 30. Read. Thus saith Yahweh, write ye this. Thus saith Yahweh, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So this is a verse brothers take you to thinking, thinking they're disclaiming uh, Messiah's kingship because Messiah comes from the line of Judah and this is the prophecy against one of the wicked kings, one of David's grandsons named uh, Jeconiah and they say, see, Messiah can't be a king because right here Jeconiah is cursed. Read that curse on Jeconiah again. I Thus saith Yahweh, write ye this man childless a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So how's this man going to be seedless and then none of his sons are going to be prosperous sitting on the throne? The Masoretic text contradicts himself right then and there. It's, the Masoretic text is saying that Jeconiah is going to be seedless, but, it, but then it turns around and says, that none of his, his sons are going to be prosperous. Which one is it? Is he going to be seedless or none of his sons going to be prosperous? The text is muddied up, family. This is what the text really says. Jeremiah 23, verse 30. Write ye this man an outcast, for there shall none of his seed at all grow up to sit on the throne of David or as the prince yet in Judah. So Jeconiah is not going to be seedless. He's going to have sons, but because of his wickedness, none of his sons are going to have a, a, a healthy, a successful rulership. That's what the, the curse is. So this is not against the Messiah coming from David, and Messiah can't have a kingship. That's not what the curse is saying. If these brothers had a Septuagint, they would understand, but because they're just following captain doctrine, they're just following bishop doctrine, they're just following homeboy doctrine, they think they're cutting somebody down, proving Messiah can't be a king, and they run it with false doctrine. It makes sense, too, when you read it and realize we didn't have chapter breaks, and you go right to chapter 23, and, it, and it tells you that the days are coming where he will raise up a righteous rising for David. You see and, that? So if you read it just like if we was talking or in conversation, we would have been like, Jeconiah, your sons will be cursed, but I will raise up a righteous king to sit on the throne of David. It would have just been a continuance. But when you turn pages and cutting and doing all that stuff, it, messes, it, it, it can be taken the wrong way. And all these chapter breaks came by non-Israelites. We're behind enemy lines. These Israelites didn't come up with these chapter breaks. Now, that makes sense when you read that out of, out of Jesse shall be a root, and then the Messiah is called the branch. I'm going too deep here. It makes sense. It makes sense when we bring it out. Let's go to the next one. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 and verse 31.
if this if this was a, a psychopedia family, if the Bible, let me, let, me, let me make sure I'm specific with my words. If the Masoretic text was an encyclopedia, we would have to burn it. No one could no one could cite from that if we don't found 12 errors already. Your teacher was like, no, you can't use that. That text is no good. Ezekiel 34 and verse 31. Shema. Shema. Read. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your Alahayim, saith Yahweh Alahayim. Read it one more time out, real slow. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture are men. Anybody see a problem with that? Are men. Huh? Are men. Are men. You're trying to make it seem like everybody. Are men. Everybody. How do you go? How do you how how does a flock grow, family? Male and female. Male and female. So this is what Ezekiel really says. Well, this is what Yah really says through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34 and verse 30. Did I put them up? 31, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 34 and 31. Sometimes the verses don't match up. You just got to uh, search for things in the Septuagint. It says, Ye are my sheep, even the sheep of my flock, and I am Yahweh, your Allah, saith the Most High Yah. It didn't say nothing about my, my flock is men. You can't have a flock of men. What, what y'all, uh, let's not even go there. Even, even um even here you see that the R is in uh you see it's in italic size too in the Masoretic and then it's telling you that it's added. Come, mm -hmm. come. For those of you just maybe tuning in, you may be new. Anytime you read in the in the Masoretic text in the King James, you see italic size words, you see parentheses, you see brackets. There's all indicators that the, the publishers or the translators have added something to the text. That's not original writings that you're reading from. So that's that's number 12 already. The next one, let's go to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, 19. Lock it, Mara. Real, real quick, uh, before you get too far away from the book of Jeremiah, uh -huh. uh, if it's not in your notes, you mind going over uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 25 and 26? Come on, let's go back. I don't, I, I don't, yeah, I'm going in order, so I don't have it. I don't have it. You said Jeremiah 9. 25 and 26. I saw this one the other day, and I meant to ask you about it, but it has slipped my mind. But all praises to spirit just always brings us back to one accord. Um, so you said verse 25 and 26? Um, okay, read it out of the KJV. Let me still find it. In this okay. Uh, it okay. says, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Verse 26 Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon, and Moab, and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. So you just read the KJV? Mm -hmm. KJV. You read it one more time real slow. Okay, it says, verse 25, it says, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will punish all them which are un which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Verse 26, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness for all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. Okay, so here go the original in the Septuagint. 
Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 25. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, when I will visit upon all the, the circumcised their uncircumcision. Let me start over. Verse 25. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, when I will visit upon all the circumcised their uncircumcision. Verse 26. On Egypt and on Idumea and on Edom and on the children of Ammon and on the children of Moab and on everyone that shaves his face round about, even them that dwell in the wilderness. For all the Gentiles are uncircumcised in their flesh and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in their hearts. Y'all see the difference? Yeah, y'all see the difference? It didn't include Judah as being punished. As being punished there. And it makes sense when I learned about too, about when it says and shaves the things along his face. He's talking about those nations which he just mentioned. But if you ever go look or you could Google it, I checked with two other Moraz who too as well back when I was first learning, and they both sent me the same stuff and they didn't know that I was asking both of them the same question. But if you ever see those people over there in Africa, different uh, places, the cuttings in their flesh, Save their face along their face, where they got all these lumps and marks and scars. Seal. The stinger seal. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah. That's, to me, to my knowledge, that sounds perfectly in line with what it's talking about here. Because those cuttings are shaves. Or, or shaves or they usually pertain to work of, of another Allah or power. Tom, Tom, and, and that's what we're going to, um, God willing, we're still here. We'll go into the language next week because the English shaves is the closest word they probably got to our cutting or something. So that, that was a great precept. I didn't even have that in my, um, I didn't know about this one, so I just added it to my list. So my list is growing and growing. Thank you for that. I thought Seal got burnt in the face. Huh? I thought Seal got burnt, burnt in the face. Bur burnt marks? Yeah, then get burnt. Yeah, then he get burnt. Okay, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Still, you've seen, oh, I could show you the pictures. You've seen right oh, yeah. The hair mics, they, they cut their faces. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about Seal, but the burn marks and all that is still bring the more off. Because you can't come in, if you're if you're marred or maimed, you can't come into the congregation. So for us, we we you definitely can't be a priest if you're if you if something wrong with you, like you got a, 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 a defect, mm -hmm. you can't definitely be a high priest. But if something's wrong with me, I can't come into the temple to worship. That that's our that's our culture. Wow. So you burning your face or cutting your face, that's not part of our culture. So thank you for that. I, that's another one to add to the list, Jeremiah 9. Verses 25 through 26, we don't get punished. The nations get punished. Judah doesn't get punished. So the list keeps growing and growing, family. This is this is, is ridiculous. You can't just open up a Bible and think you have understanding. I don't care how many nights you study, and I'm reading to you right here. I'm just giving you book. No, you're not. No, you're not. It's not being selfish. I'm not, I'm not trying to embarrass anyone or belittle anyone. It's not your fault. We're behind enemy lines. So I got some good brothers, Israelites and Christians, who really think they're going deep, 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 and they're bringing something out. You, you don't even know you're dealing with a corrupted text. Let's slow down, be Bereans. Ezekiel 37, verse 19. Ezekiel 37, verse 19. Shaman. Shema. Shema. Read, say unto them, Thus saith Adoniah, Alahayim, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. Read that again real slow out. Say unto them, Thus saith Adonai, Allahim, 
Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. So they should be one in my hand. This is what the original really says. Ezekiel 37 and 19. Then shall thou say to, to them, Thus saith Yahweh, Behold, I will take the tribe of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel that belong to him, and I will add to them the tribe of Judah, and they shall become one rod in the hand of Judah. In the hand of Judah. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. Judah, the fourth tribe, that's our tribe, we're going to control or rule the whole 12 tribes because we remain faithful, not perfectly, but out of the whole house of Israel, the 12 tribes, Judah always had that one saying, you know what? Y'all sit this punishment. Tear down those idols. Tear down those groves. And let's come back to Yah. So Judah is going to have the whole 12 tribes. The Masoretic text is, gro is grossly mistranslated here. Grossly corrupted. These are not just minor changes, as Dr. Simone would tell you. These are major, major changes. Major changes. The next one. Let's go to Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 29. Ya Allah, Ya Allah or Joel is really Ya Allah. Yah Allah is Yah is my power. Yah is my God. Yah Allah. Joel 2.29. Read. And also upon the servants and upon the handsmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Read that again. You want, read the KJV? you want to read 28? Yeah, start at 20 to get the context. And it shall, uh, Joel 2, verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see my, shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. This is what it really says. Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Okay, all flesh, right? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. We got to kick it. We got to keep it in context. This all flesh is the flesh of the sons and daughters of the Israelites, right? It continues on. Uh, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Verse 29 is, is the difference here. And on my servants, and on my handmaids, will, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Y'all see the difference? Y'all see the difference? Read, read 29 again in, in the KJV. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. So it... The, the Masoretic text makes it seem generic on the servants and on the handmaids, but it says specifically on my servants and on my handmaids. Who are the servants of Yah? Israel. The children of Israel. You see how Dr. Seminary and the Christians can slide things in there? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he said the servants too. So the, the, the Gentile servants are going, to, are going to speak. That don't make sense. It's the servants of Yah, the children of Israel. So again, we get more and more lies. If this was a encyclopedia, if this was a dictionary, it would be only good for firewood. For firewood. Y'all turn the air back on. I'm definitely hot. I'm, yeah, I'm hot to cold, but whatever y'all want to do. 
Amen. And we're going to stay here and go down to another one I call uh, Joel 2 and 32. Joel 2 and 32. Those online, uh, I hope you are, are writing them down. If not, I, I can send a presentation out so you can have them as well. And even if you don't have a, a, a physical Septuagint, the Septuagint is available online. So uh, let's go down to Joel 2 and 32. Joel 2 and 32. Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be his deliverance, or shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, and, the, and in the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. This is what it really says. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yah shall be saved. Okay, whosoever. That means anybody, right? Mm -hmm. But let's kick it. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall the saved ones. Salah, can you start over? For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall the saved one be as Yah had said. And they that have glad tidings preach to them whom Yahweh Shai has called. Did y'all catch that? Let me read it again. And it shall come to pass that whosoever, that whosoever shall call on the name of Yah shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall the saved one be as the Most High has said. And they that have had, and they that have, have glad tidings preached to them whom Yahweh Shai has called. Who had glad tidings preached to them? Israel. Israel. Who preached the glad tidings? Yahweh Shai. Isaiah 60. Mm -hmm. uh, is it Isaiah 60, is it? Or Isaiah uh, 60. 60. And then he, he quoted in uh, Luke. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 7, I think it is. Mm -hmm. The spirit of Yah is upon me to preach glad tidings. Let's get it since we quoted it. Let's get it out of the New Testament, uh, Let's go, I think it's in Luke 7, or the Luke 14. I think the Luke 7, my, my memory is getting stronger, that's what I'm saying. He grabbed the Isaiah scroll, is it Luke 7? It's brought out. Oh, is it Luke 4? I was way off, wasn't it? I want to say 14. Oh, no, it's, it's you right. Luke 4. Let's go to Luke 4, 18 to put this in context. So this is how we marry the New Testament with the Old Testament. And let me put the phrase in front of that. This is how we marry the so-called New Testament with the so-called Old Testament. Uh, let's read Luke 4 and 18. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The spirit of Adonai is upon me because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of Adonai. So this is the good tidings that Messiah is preaching when he walked the earth. This is straight, uh, straight out of Isaiah. Now, now we can marry this in the Septuagint, Joel chapter 2, verse 31, saying salvation is for those who had glad tidings preached to them. So Hamasha only came to preaching glad tidings to the 12 tribes of Israel. So how are you getting salvation if the, if the good news, if the basar wasn't preached to you? If you want salvation and you didn't have the glad tidings preached to you, you got to come to the Israelites. That's what the text is saying. Let me read this again out of Septuagint so people know we ain't making stuff up. 
This is Joel 2 and 31 out of the Septuagint, and I'm just going to read that again out of your so-called New Testament. Joel 2 and 31, I, uh, I'm sorry, Salakia. Joel 2 and 32 out of the Septuagint. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yah shall be saved. Okay, this is salvation. Where is salvation going to be? For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall the saved one be, as the Lord has said. And they that have glad tidings preached to them, whom Yahweh Shai has called. So Yahweh Shai preached glad tidings. Let's get it again in Luke 4, 18. Luke 4, chapter, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The spirit of Adonijah is upon me because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of Adonijah. Salvation was preached to the Israelites. Messiah brought bad tidings. Messiah brought good news to the broken heart of Israel. So according to the original text, or according to the better reading that's found in the Septuagint, salvation is for those in Israel who had glad tidings preached to them. The KJV is up, we're up to 15 adorations in the KJV. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to Amos 6 and 3. Amos 6 and 3. Just keep going over a couple pages. Amos 6 and 3. Read. I, I went to the uh, Septuagint first. We're walking down all, not all, we're walking down over 30 adorations of the Mesoretic text that the King James used. Amos 6 and 3. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. That's all you got? Yeah, unless you want to read 4. No, no. So just read verse 3 again out. Ye that put away the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near. Far away. Read it again. He, he, he missed something. Far away. Did you say far away? Near. Read it one more time. This is the KJV one more time. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near. This is what it really says. Amos 6 and 3 out of the Septuagint. Ye who are approaching the evil day, who are drawing near and adopting false Sabbaths. Mm, 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 mm. What do y'all think they're talking about? What do you think the Most High is talking about? Adopting false Sabbaths. Sat, uh, Sunday. Sunday we're talking about them. <laughs> Read it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Read one more time. I didn't set that out of the KJV. I was saying this one. That was good. I had this marked in the KJV, but not in my uh, Septuagint. Um, Ye that put far away the evil day, Amos 6, verse 3, KJV. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near. This is what it really says in Septuagint, Amos 6 and 3. Ye who are approaching the evil day, you are approaching Sunday, you are approaching Halloween, you are approaching Christmas. It says, ye who are approaching the evil day, who are drawing near and adopting false Sabbaths. False Sabbaths. So yes. your doctrine that it doesn't matter what day we, we gather. Wow. The Most High says you are approaching evil because you are approaching false Sabbaths. Wow. We worship them every day. <laughs> Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Hallelujah. <laughs> Get that organ. Do, 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 Hold my mule. I shot right here. You shot on a false day. So today is not the true set apart Sabbath, but we honored it yesterday the best we could. Yes, I had to work yesterday. 
Yes, I got to keep a roof over my head in Babylon, but I set it apart the best I could, and God saw my heart. So you telling people that Sunday, it doesn't matter, we worship every day of the week. Amos 6 and 3 in the Septuagint say you are approaching an evil day. And real it's quick, Mariah, just to go back to what Shabbat or Sabbath really means, doesn't it mean oath or promise? Come. Come. So Come. pretty much y'all saying y'all are approaching false promises out here. <laughs> He, he's, he's saying that you're, you're holding to false covenants, the no. covenant with Hasatan in that Catholic, Catholic church. church. Bring that it out. Antichrist. Bring it out. You're following false oaths of Rome. I'm sorry, false Rome of Babylon, because I'm going to bring it out. Rome has nothing original. People, and I'm, I'm just going to let it flow. I'm tired of playing with these people. P people with this virgin birth we're about to bring out. They try to build a straw man. Yeah, that, that version birth is Catholicism. And there's a book you can download if you want to get a head start. The uh, Two Babylons. This Roman Catholic priest threw his own people under the bus. And he says, I guess he got a chance to travel. I, I don't remember the backstory. But this Catholic priest says, nothing we're doing here in Rome is original. Everything we're doing in Rome, we got from Babylon. So when people tell you that, oh, you're following, uh, you following after Rome with this virgin birth, Rome doesn't have anything original. Rome is following after Babylon. Babylon was following, uh, was was the home of the uh, fallen angel. Let me let me stop. Let me stop. I'm, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. Rome has nothing original. So if Rome has a virgin birth, look around who they copying off of. Let's continue on here. So we're up the. 16 lies of the KJV. We have the 16 lies of the Mesoretic text. Amos 9 and 12. Heidi Papaniah says, but wait, there's more. Amos 9 and 12. Amos 9 and 12. Shema. Shema. Read. Uh, verse. 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith Yahweh that does this. Read that again, book chapter and verse, please. Amos chapter 9, verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith Yahweh that doeth this. This is what it really says. That the remnant of men and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called may earnestly seek me, saith the Most High, who does all these things. Y'all see a problem with that? Y'all see the difference? Y'all see the difference? Say it again. Read it again. So read yours again. I'm going to follow up with you. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith Yahweh, that doeth this. Verse 12 out of the, Amos 9 and 12 out of the Septuagint. That the, that the remnant of men and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called may earnestly seek me, saith the Most High, who does all these things. So you, right. have, you have to know the history of Israel. These Gentiles upon whom his name is called is who? The northern tribe. The northern tribe. Because the Gentiles, the heathens, he was never, they were never called by his name. Do we have a proof text? Can we verify what I'm saying? I got Acts 15 and 17 written down here, but I don't know if it goes with it or not. We don't have to go that far. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 63. I got that too, Isaiah 63 and 19. Can you bring it out for him out? Isaiah 63 and 19, we're going to show you that when the Masoretic text is telling you upon the Gentiles who my name is called, the, the, the slippery seminary preacher says, see, everyone is called by his name who's obedient. Everyone who repents and believes in Christ is, is called by his name. It's lies. It's false doctrine. Isaiah 63 and 19. I could start at 17 for context. Let me use you. Uh, Isaiah 53 
verse 17. O Yahweh, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and harden our hearts from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake, the tribes of thine inheritance. The who? The tribes of thine inheritance. The world? The tribes of thine inheritance. The Gentiles. The tribes of thine inheritance. Uh huh. The people of thy holiness mm -hmm. have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. So you have to always keep our history of, of the Israelites in the forefront when you're trying to read these scrolls. So for Amos 9 and 19 to say, or what was that, Amos 9 and 12? For Amos 9 and 12 to say the Gentiles whom upon my name is called, it's a contradiction because Isaiah is speaking, Amos and Isaiah are prophets speaking for Yah. Is Yah a schizophrenic? Is Yah a liar? Does Yah change his mind? Prove it. How do we how can we prove it? Um Micah, I change not Micah's. Malachi 3 6. Malachi, yeah. I'm the most high God, I change not. So why would the most high tell um why would most high tell Amos that I'm going to bring the Gentiles upon whom my name is called? But he did he tell Isaiah the healers are not called by my name? The tribes of my inheritance is who I'm restoring. This is how you gotta kick it, you gotta keep it in context. You can't allow yourself to be uh just wooed away with these smooth, charismatic preachers and for us Israelites. You can't be all fascinated by these YouTube stars and these YouTube gurus. I can speak the um, Marinetra. I can speak. I can. I can speak the hieroglyphs. And I wrote five books. And I know Hebrew. I know the Yiddish. And none of that matters. You gotta kick it. Keep it in context. The heathens were never called by the Father's name. So Amos nine and twelve. These Gentiles upon whom the Father's name is called. It's the northern kingdom who were kicked out, kicked away, cast out of his sight way back in the book of Kings. That's the Gentiles that are called by his name. The other Gentiles that, that's going to cleave to us, they are called strangers. The strangers have a chance, but these are not strangers here. These are Gentiles from the northern kingdom who were kicked out way before the, Israel, before the tribe of Judah. That's how we kick it. That's how we keep it in context. Let's go to the next one, number 18, Micah 4, 8. Micah 4, 8. We're almost to the end here. Micah 4, verse 8. Just keep turning a couple pages over. Micah 4, 8. Shema. 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 Read. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Read that again, out. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. This is what it really says. And thou, dark tower of the flock, daughter of Zion, on thee the dominion shall come and enter in, even the first kingdom from Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. The first kingdom of Babylon shall come. What is this saying, family? What is this saying? Read yours again in the, in the corrupted Masoretic text. I... And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Isaiah, I mean, Micah 4 and 8 in the original, or, or the closer Masoretic, the, uh, the, the, the better read. I'm going to say, the Septuagint is not the best. The best is to have the original. But the Septuagint is the better copy that we got in today's time. Micah 4 and 8 in the Septuagint. And thou, dark tower of the flock, 
daughter of Zion, on thee the dominion shall come and enter in, even the first kingdom from Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. So the Masoretic text doesn't even mention Babylon. Zion is going to inherit the 12 tribes again, the first kingdom from Babylon. Y'all see that? I did. These texts are dirty. These texts are dirty. Let's go to the next one. And it's and this one reads out of Babylon, and it makes sense to me. Um, because all the tribes everywhere else now is Babylon, pretty much. Everyone Khan. Khan. We just believe that Khan. Khan. We got some more reading to do. We're almost done with these verses, and we might just go into a little bit of history. Uh, number 19. Psalms, now we're about to run through Psalms. Psalms has a whole lot. Psalms 2 and 6. Now we're just going to stay in Psalms, I believe, for the rest of the time. Psalms 2 and 6. Again, this is not to deter you from reading the Bible. This is to push you into the arms of Yahweh Shah. If you don't keep the commandments and you don't seek Messiah, you will not have understanding. That's not my words. That's what he said in the book of John. Let me get it because it's on my heart now. He brought it out, I think, last week. Once again, just to elaborate, from what I said last week, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yah. Oh, don't God. allow these books to become an idol and don't have the mindset, well, if it's not in this book, I'm not going to go by it. We, gotta, huh. we, got, we, got, we can't be snared by that. Huh. You have to seek the Father and if you're seeking the Father, you got to go through the Son. And if you're coming to the Son, the Son says you got to keep the commandments. If you're not keeping commandments, he's not going to talk to you. He's not going to talk to you. Let me pull that up. It's on my heart. Psalms 2, verse 6. Thank you for that, Mariah. Psalms 2, verse 6. Shaman? Shaman. Read. Psalms chapter 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Psalms 2, verse 6 in Septuagint. He's going on the right chapter here. The number all kind of crazy here. Read it again. Let me see. Make sure I'm married. It's up right. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Okay, so this is in the Septuagint, Psalms two and six. But I have, but I have been made king by him on Zion, his holy mountain. Y'all see the difference? Y'all see the difference? Read yours again in the corruption. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So the Masoretic said, I have set, set, read it again. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This right here says, but I have been made king by him on Zion. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. The Septuagint is in first person. The Septuagint is the Messiah talking. Septuagint says, Psalms 2, 6, but I have been made king by him on Zion in his holy mountain, declaring the ordinances of the Most High. The Most High said to me, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That reads totally different. The Masoretic text is corrupted, and this is one of the ones that they want to push everything messianic. They want to write it out. Because the, the, the Masoretic priest but Talmudis, and that that alludes right to Messiah. Now they believe in the Messiah, but these Masoretes the, these Masoretes don't want to admit that the one they hung up in the New Testament is the Messiah. So they gotta everything that points to that one being him, they gotta deter you from it. 
That's why they change things. That's why they change things. Let's go to the next one. I hope that's there and not out to keep people out. Navarro, you just raise your hand or you, that was old? It was old, so I can. Okay, I, 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 I'm trying to do this. Remind me clean to do this. Make sure that I update Zoom or something. I think uh, maybe um, if y'all get kicked out from us, let us know um, those coming back into the room. So that was songs two and six. Number 20, songs two and 12. Psalms 2 and 12. Psalms chapter 2, verse 12. Kiss the son, <clears throat> kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Read that again, uh, Psalms 2 and 12. Kiss the son, lest he become angry, or lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalms 2 and 12 in the Septuagint. Accept correction, at least at any time, the Most High be angry, and ye should perish from the righteous way. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. They don't say nothing about kissing the sun. Mm -hmm. It says accept correction. That Masoretic text is garbage. Don't want nothing that's going to be hard work. <laughs> garbage. These Masoretic priests, these Talmudists are wicked. Deuteronomy 4 2 says, do not add or take away. You can drop it, Queen. I'm, cool. I'm fine. You don't, don't worry about me. So that's number 20, family. We got 20 lies from the Masoretic text. Let's go run down these last 10. That Psalms 2 is basically just telling you to keep the law. Keep the law. Basically mm -hmm. saying. Keep the law. Psalms 18 and 43. Psalms 18 and 43. Again, if this Masoretic text was a was a scholarship work, a psychopedia or a dictionary, by their own standards, you would have to throw it away. We just found 20 errors in their in their work. Is not a valid text according to their own standards. Now, how are you reading a holy text with all these corruptions in it? You're not reading a holy text. This Bible is not produced. Huh? No, I was just reading that again. Kiss the sun and accept correction. Say nothing about kissing the sun. Yeah, no. <laughs> says accept correction. I know. Like that correction. Is, yeah, it's like eat uh, Anyway. Uh. Maybe that's where they get kissing the Pope ring. Mm, maybe. Hmm. Hmm. So 18 to 43. I mean, it's just like, I mean, it's like a child, you know, when you when you're trying to correct your child, they mom, they, they wanna they wanna kiss up to you so they don't get that correction. So I don't know. I just some thoughts running through my head. It's crazy. 1843. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and and thou hast made me the head of the heathen, a people whom I have not known shall serve me. All right, I'm still looking for read it again. It's gonna be song. Well, probably it's gonna be songs uh, seventeen and yours. Yeah, we read it again. Let me hear what it says. Their number differently. Thou has delivered me from the people, from the strivings of the people, and thou has made me the head of the heathen, a people whom I have not known shall serve me. Oh, here it is. Here it is. So this is what it really says. Psalms. 18 to 43, it could be different in your Septuagint. You got to fish around. The Septuagint is sometimes a chapter off. That's why it takes a while to find. You got to hear it read again. It says, Psalm 1843, deliver me from the gang sayings of the people. Thou shalt make me head of the Gentiles, a people whom I knew not served me. At the hearing of the ear, they obeyed me. The strange children lied to me. Y'all see the difference? 
Read yours again. I, I can't even find that one in mine. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, I think my my chapters are numbered a little weird, but it should be either Psalms 17 or Psalms 18, depending on your translation. It's supposed to be Psalm 17, but you know, mine's has changed too. Mine's yeah. is way it don't say nothing. It says I will crush them like dust at the face of the wind. So I don't know which one that. What the, what read the measure with it? Make sure I, I married this up right. Yeah, I think you did. Thou has delivered me from the strivings of the people, uh -huh. and thou has made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. So that reads kind of kind of the same. We give them credit there. Read it again. Let me see why I marked this one. Thou has delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou has made me the head of the heathen, a people whom I have not known shall serve me. So the Septuagint is reading pretty much dead on. Deliver me from the game saints of the people. Thou shalt make me head of the Gentiles, a people whom I knew not serves me. So it, it, it reads a little better in the Septuagint, but uh, we, we're just giving credit for that one. We still got more than enough witnesses that the Mesoamerican text is corrupt. But that wasn't too bad. That wasn't too bad. Psalms 20. Let's go to Psalms 20. And read the first six. Uh, let's see what you got in the first six verses. Yeah, how I hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the Alahayim of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our Alahayim we will set up our banners. Yahweh, fulfill all thy petitions. Now know that I, now know I that Yahweh saveth his anointed. He will hear from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. So this is where they try to be slick again. I'm just going to harp on verse six because the first five verses are dead on. This is verse six is where these Talmudists try to be slick and change it up in the Septuagint, I mean, in the Masoretic text. Read this verse six again in the Masoretic text. Now that I now know I that Yahweh saveth his anointed, he will hear he will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. This is how it really reads, verse six. Now I know that Yahweh has saved his Christ. He shall hear him from his holy heaven. You see the difference? In the Masoretic text, it says the anointed. And the anointed, you can wiggle that for all the people. But it specifically said his Christ. Hamashiach. Not anointed Mashiach, because all of us are Mashiach. All of us are anointed as children of Israel to be holy and to win the loss. But when we say Hamashiach, that's the Christ. Y'all see the difference? These Talmudists try to take it away from Hamashiach. Everything that we allude to the Messiah, the Talmudists try to uh, undermine it. They try to weaken it. So no, no, no take that if you haven't already. Psalms 20 and verse 6 has been corrupted. Everything messianic, they have, they have corrupted it. Let's go on to the next one, Psalms 44. Psalms 44. And let me see. I, I read Psalms 44 and verse 14. Let me see how it reads. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. Okay, that reads the same. That one's definitely true. That that reads the same. Go to go to uh, Psalms forty five. Let's see how that reads. Forty five and fourteen. Psalms 
Yeah, that's the one I wanted. It's 45. Psalms 45 and 14. She shall be brought unto the king in the raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. Read that again, up. She shall be brought unto the king in the raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. Underline needlework in your Masoretic text. Underline needlework in your Masoretic text. Here's, here's the truth about sisters and their garments. Because there's a doctrine out there that sisters, that the Frenches are not for the sisters. You ever heard that? There's a doctrine that the Frenches are just for the men. So I'm going to pick this up at Psalms 45 and 13 in the Septuagint. Psalms 45 and 13 in the Septuagint. I'm going to read on down. All her glory is that of the daughter of the king of Esabon. Robed as he is in golden fringed garments, verse 14, in embroidered clothing, virgins shall be brought to the king after her. Her fellows shall be brought to thee. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. If you look, if you do a word search lexicon for embroidered, where it came right out and said in fringed garments, and then embroidered too, embroidered, where you put embroiders at, uh, Queen? What what are the borders meant or usually are in a garment? On the on the um hem. On the hem. Mm -hmm. So this right here shows you that the daughters of Sarah, the daughters of Zion, they too put fringes on their garments. Let me read it again out of Septuagint. Psalms 45 and 13. All her glory is that of the daughter of the king of Esabon, robed as she is in golden fringe garments. In embroidered clothing, virgins shall be brought to the king after her. So that shows you that our sisters too wear fringed garments on their on their um, own. Like <laughs> when you go back to where it's commanded at, when you go back to Numbers of uh, 15, it doesn't say speak to the men of Israel. It says speak to the children of Israel and beg them to put fringes on their garments. Now he has specific commandments for men. And women, and then he has specific commandments for priests. Mm -hmm. But the fringes says, command the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. She is the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. So these brothers making up their man-made doctrines, know the fringes are just for the men. Book, chapter, and verse. Just give me book. Don't give me your captain's doctrine. Don't give me your rabbi's doctrine. Give me the text. Give me the book. We're almost done with these uh, 30 verses, 30, 31 verses. The next one up, we're going to Psalms 47 and 9. And Gerald says, Sun worship. I missed that kind of. Probably when we were talking about keeping the um, false Sabbaths. False Sabbaths, calm. Calm. The next one is Psalms 47 and 9. Psalms chapter 47, verse 9. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the power or Allahim of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto the Most High. He is greatly exalted. We got again up. Psalms chapter 47, verse 9. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the Alahim of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to Alahim. He is greatly exalted. Okay, so it's not marrying up. <laughs> yeah, mine's, uh, mine's in the Septuagint says, the most high rules over the nations. He is seated upon his holy throne. And then, it, then verse 10 says, the rulers of the people are gathered together with the God of Abraham, for Yah's mighty ones of earth are magnified very much. And in my KJ LXX, it's Psalms 46. Maybe it's 46. But it's still, like some of these, is like even the verses are off. Yeah. Okay, I think I can read it again. I think I got it here. This is, where's, where's yours in the Masoretic? 
So it's 47 and 9. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the Alaheim of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto the Most High. He is greatly exalted. Read that again. I got it. Yep. Read it again. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the Most High of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto Yah. He is greatly exalted. Here we go. We got him, family. We caught him again. This is uh, Psalms 47 and 9 in the Septuagint. The rulers of the people are assembled with the Allahim of Abram. For God's mighty ones of the earth have been greatly exalted. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you all catch that? The end of that verse says, for God's mighty ones of the earth have been greatly exalted. Mm -hmm. Who are the mighty ones of the earth? And who are about to be exalted? Israel. The children of Israel. The children of Israel. Psalms 47 and 9 is corrupted. It's corrupted. The next one up. Psalm 60. Psalms chapter 60. Psalms chapter 60. It must be a short chapter for me not to put a verse. Seven. Um, that's fifty five or sixty five. What's the element of town? One. So I hate these. It's, it's Psalm sixty and, and it's verse seven and yours. It's got to be fifty nine, most likely. Psalms 59 and mine is the first nine. So 60, read what you got. Uh, Gilead is mine. Gil on. Gilead That's is mine, right. and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the hold strength. On, hold on. Uh, start at the top so I can, I can find where we at in mine. What, what start with verse one? O Alahim, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us. Come. You read? No, no, no. Go to the, 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 the verse you just read. Verse 7. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Come. That's what we wanted. Psalm 60 and verse 7. Psalm 60, verse 7. Gilead is mine, or Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. And Ephraim or Aparayim is mine. Slock, slock it. Ephraim or Aparayim is the strength of my head. Verse 8. Judah is my king. Judah is my king. Judah is not a lawgiver family. Judah is the royal tribe. So everywhere they try to say Judah is the lawgiver, the Talmud is trying to keep control of the people. Like they got a right to tell you what to do. Man, he says he's gonna give Edom the boot. Come, <laughs> come. So, Psalm sixty and eight. Judah is my king, not my lawgiver. Not my lawgiver. We call him again, lion. Huh? No, no, I was just reading it. Um, which Jamari was talking about. We got a few more. Psalm sixty and nineteen. We way past our life threshold. Like, like right, even right here, it says, Moab is my wash pot over Edom. I will cast out my shoe. And then in here, it's, and yours might read different. I always check both because I got the newer edition. Yours is some, most of the time better. It says, Moab is the cauldron of my hope. Over Edom, I will stretch out my shoe. Huh. Not cast out. out my shoe. Stretch out. Yeah. So I'm going to walk over it. It's and like I'm going to give you the boot. Yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna... to walk. To tread you underfoot. Yeah. My, my people want to tread you underfoot. Stop the devil head, Marie. Stop, stop, stop. Stop the devil out. Stop the devil out. Stop the devil out. Stop the devil out. Stop the Stop It makes more sense. It makes more sense, family. It makes more sense. 
Stop, stop, stop. Stop the devil. We're going to stop the eater, Mike. The white man is the knowledge. Let's go to the next one. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 and 19. Psalm 68 and 19. I started at the top so I can marry these chapters up. You should be in Psalm 67. So. Uh, okay. What, what, what kind of start? Uh, for the end by David, a psalm of, of the song, let the most high rise up and his enemies be scattered. They made a song out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I may be right now. 68 verse 19. What you got for 19? Blessed be, uh, blessed be Adonaya, who daily loaded us with benefits, even the Alahayim of our salvation. Which song are you looking for? 68? 68 and 19. Yeah. Yeah, I got it more. Read it again. Blessed be Adonaiah, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the Alahayim of our salvation, Salah. Wow. Read it one more time. I watched this, y'all. Psalm 68 and 19. Three. Blessed be Adonaiah, who, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the Alahayim of our salvation, Salah. This is what it really says. Psalm 68 and 19 out of the Septuagint. Blessed be, I'm going to read the pagan terms, right? So y'all really get this. Blessed be the Lord God. Blessed be the Lord daily. And the God of our salvation shall prosper us. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. If we bless him daily, he's going to prosper us. It doesn't say blessed be who daily loads us with benefits. And I've been posting that for our daily morning inspirations. And I didn't even check with the Septuagint. Again, Psalm 68 and 19, the Septuagint. Blessed be Yah, blessed be Yah daily. The Allah of our salvation shall prosper us. It reads totally different, mm -hmm. totally different. Psalms 87. Psalms 87. And I think it's, we can start at verse 4. Psalms 87 and verse 4. Psalms chapter 87. Psalms chapter 87, verse 4. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion, it shall be said, this and that man was born in her and the highest himself shall establish her. Yahweh shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. Selah. Keep going. Mm -hmm. it, it reads totally. It, it, it's, it's almost on. Start at, start at the top so we can get the full context. Psalms 87 from the top. His foundation is in the holy mountains. Yahweh loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of Alahim, Salah. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion, it shall be said, this and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. Yahweh shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there, Selah. So you'll notice that the Masoretic corruption is, it keeps saying this man was born there, right? So I'm going to pick it up at verse 4 because that's where it starts to stray at. Eight, Psalms 87, verse 4, and listen to how, how the original order better Septuagint reads. Psalms 87 and 4. I will make mention of Rahab 
and Babylon to them that know me. Behold also the Philistines and Tyre and the people of the Ethiopians. These were born there. A man shall say, Zion is my mother, and such a man as was born in her, and the highest himself has founded her. What, what does it sound like it's saying to y'all, family? These were born there. Let me read it again. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, also the Philistines and Tyre and the people of the Ethiopians, these were born there. So the northern kingdom found their way into Tyre first. The northern kingdom didn't come over here right away. When we first got left, uh, got scattered, we went around Africa first. So what this verse is saying, I'm going to call my people to remember in the land of their captivity. That's what this verse is saying. But the Masoretic keeps focusing on this man. But it's really saying these people were born there. Y'all see the difference? Read yours again. And all, I mean, and that's that's in italicized there too, in the, in there, and it, it doesn't make any sense that when he's talking about places and then to just all of a sudden go and say this man. This man. It does it totally, it doesn't even make any sense at all, but they know that more majority of people not even gonna go this deep in a study. So, I mean, it's it just something that doesn't even fit at all to say, I will make mention of Rahab or Rahab and Babylon to them that know me, behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this man was born there. Nobody even talks like that in English. It's all the cap is where we were scattered. Because remember, now this is when you gotta kick it, keep it in context, because earlier when we went to Isaiah, where it said Isaiah 63 and 19, the heathens were not called by your name. So Father, Abba Yah, if the heathens are not called by your name, why are you going to Rahab? Because Rahab is a city also. Rahab is a woman, but it's a city too. Why are you going to pagan cities to them that know you if the heathens are not called by your name? Y'all see how you got to use textual criticism? The he, he's going to these pagan cities, the people that know him, because that's where his children are. Mm -hmm. So that's a corruption. This man is no, is these people were born there. We were born in Babylon, but he's coming to us, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Psalms 87 and 4 is a corruption. Psalms 87 and 4, and it reads totally different than these people were born there rather than this man was born there. It's totally different meaning of the text. It's not small, minor changes like Dr. Seminary would tell you. These are major changes, major changes. All right, the um, next one we're going to, let's go to Psalms 151. 151. Psalms 151. There is no 151. Say what? There is no 151. Uh oh, we got Berean in the house. She's dark. She's dark today. So the Jesus thing, he knows Psalms 151. So if you got a KJV, aka a Mesoretic text, your text stops at Psalms 150. But in the Septuagint and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a Psalms 151, and it reads, uh, the title is, or it gives you a backstory, Psalms 151. This song is a genuine one of David, though super, super numeric, composed when he fought in a single combat with, Go, with Goliath, or uh, I guess Goliath. And it reads, Psalms 151, verse 1, I was small among my brethren. And youngest in my father's house, I tended my father's sheep. My hands formed a musical instrument, and my fingers tuned a soft tree. And who shall tell my Adonai? Yahweh himself, he hears him. He sent forth his angel and took me from my father's sheep. And he anointed me with the oil of his anointing. My brothers were handsome and tall, but Yahweh did not take pleasure in them. I went forth to meet the Philistine, 
and he cursed me by his idols. Verse 7, but I drew my own sword and beheaded him and removed reproach from the children of Israel. Now, that can be debated because the Masoretic text says it was a slingshot. So I have to go with the Septuagint that David took out a sword and beheaded him. And I've seen that reenacted in film that he hit him with the slingshot, but then he got the sword and cut his head off. And, and, and historically, that makes sense because that's what you would do after you defeat, after your enemy fell. Because how hard would it be for you to take a man's head off while you're fighting? Unless you really, really or skill with the sword. And if he was a giant, he can't reach. That so high. he popped them down. And when he was on, when he, now you take his head. Give me that. Because the other kings did that too. Once you fall your enemy or fail your enemy, now you take his head off. And show it to everybody else. And then they get scared. Right. And while we're here, because <laughs> that's, who, that's who we are. That's where we come from. And while we're here talking about the giants, we're going to have a, a Just Give Me Book TV episode about the giants. Um, Hollywood make them like nine feet tall, ten feet tall. More historically, in the context, they would the giants will be anywhere from seven to nine feet, and seven to nine feet to us is huge because Shaq is seven feet, and I'm only five eleven, six feet. And to me, I would call Shaq a giant. He's not literally a giant to me, but you imagine the average height of a man being five eight, five nine. Looking at Shaq, Shaq's a giant. So David, it tells you David was yet a young man. He wasn't the age of a warrior. So David was under the age of 20. And if, if Goliath is seven, eight feet, that's a giant. And David slew him. David slew him. So Psalms 151, you don't have it in your text. That's a corruption. He had a reach. That's a corruption. I think he was about nine feet. Anywhere, anything, like once you find the average height of a man, five, 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 nine, let's just say, Judah is six feet tall. They probably smaller than They could be smaller because we didn't have all these uh, GMOs, yeah, all exactly. this, you know. So let's just say we had an Israelite that made it to six feet. Seven, seven, five, like, yo, I was like, yo, he, he kind of, I, I, I beat the brakes off that giant. Because remember, it's the everyday jargon. If I'm six feet and he's seven, seven, five, I mean, yeah, I'd be, I'd be the giant. It don't have to be way 15 feet. Keep it in context. So we're going to say one verse of Psalms for the end. Y'all good? Y'all good? We're going to say this one for the end. Let's go to Chronicles 13 and 13. First Chronicles 13 and 13. This is just showing people that you just can't open up a Bible and, and think you're getting true uh, word of the Most High. It's time in these last days to fast and pray and ask Messiah to give us understanding. Like Neriah is saying, you can't make this these books be your idol, and now you 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 just disregard seeking the Messiah. Did we read this one earlier? Did we? Obed Edom. Okay, I may have a repeat here then. All right, so we can we skip that. It said Obed Edom. We did. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can skip that. Come. Good eye. Come. And mine stay true to the to the original name here. So the foul bread. Part of the curse of us falling and uh can you get the lights? Can you see? Oh, you got your laptop on? Uh -huh. Okay. So this is not a dig on anybody because a lot of brothers trying to debate people and you, you're trying to correct people and tell people they don't know what they're talking about and, and you don't even know how you got the text you're reading. So don't be embarrassed if you have to correct something. Don't be ashamed if you got something wrong. We are the children of the slaves. We are the children of the Israelites. And defiled bread was part of our punishment. And you can find that in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 13. We won't go there for the sake of time. We got three more slides, and we're going to uh, end here for today. Let's go, and I, I will share this website at the end. And I want to, I want to show you how you got. You have to vet everything. We're behind enemy lines. This is a website online by this man, um, 
I, I, I say this identity for the end. This is a brief introduction to the canon and ancient versions of the scriptures. Focus on you. Most people today you see that queen. I can see it. Mm -hmm. Most people today receive the writings arranged and bound together in their Bibles as holy scripture simply because that is what they find bound together under that title in a book they have purchased at the bookstore. Many Protestants are also aware of the fact that in choosing a Bible, one must avoid the shelf labeled Roman Catholic Bibles because they are designed to promote Catholic beliefs and they also contain some of the books that were not even received that we do not even receive as scripture. The ones we refer to belonging as to the Apocrypha, but why do we reject these books? Very few of us have even read them. In fact, many Christians have not read all of the books which they do consider scripture. <laughs> Sound like an Israelite talk. <laughs> and this and so it is evident that most of us receive certain books and reject others, not because we personally evaluated them in any way, but because we trust that someone else has evaluated them and decided rightly concerning this matter so that all scripture and nothing but scripture is between the covers of our Bibles. Is this not what's going on? No question. Exactly no. what's going we on. We tell people, or oh, 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 you read an apocrypha, I don't really accept that book. Have you read the apocryphals? Well, I heard about them. Oh, I read them. I studied them in seminary. You, you don't get a doctorate without reading them. But tell me something. Why, why, why are they not mechanical? Because they're plagiarized. You don't know who read them. So tell me something. You just keep asking the question. You're supposed to lie. You haven't read these books and studied these books for yourself. Because mm -hmm. if you did, you'll find out that there's worse stuff in the Septuagint, in the, in the Masoretic text, that's in the, uh, in the apocrypha. And we just went through 30 verses of the Masoretic text that's in, in the word of academia. Uh, academic, like, yeah, I can't read this. I can't read from this. We just found 30 errors in your Masoretic text. And the word of academia, that's garbage. Uh, and this is, and that is a separator, I feel like, because there, you know, there's this movement of Gentiles, ethnic Gentiles, who are, are speaking about keeping the Torah, keeping the laws and things like that. But then there's a little breaking point because they still have yet to admit and understand who the real children of Israel are. So like I can remember watching one YouTube channel that does these little five and six minute clips and then they and he'll answer a question like uncovering the lies, stuff like that. But then they ask them about the Apocrypha and books like Maccabees. And they'll say things like, yeah, you know, Maccabees is fine to learn some history and stuff like that. But, you know, we don't really go too far into the apocryphal books. But the more and more you go into those books, it'll help you see and understand who the people are and what's really been going up. So I see that as like a separator, even amongst people who are starting to understand that you're supposed to keep the, the Torah. Huh. They still reject like these books. Yes. And but this is I don't want to even harp on the apocryphal books. The part the part I pulled this for is we have Israelites who know who we are and they're reading the apocryphal books, but they're just taking them as face value. Mm -hmm. Not not realizing, okay, who publishes this? Who was the editors? Because even when and, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but even the Dead Sea Scrolls, when you go find the publishers and the archaeologists that's digging digging out the earth, they're all mm -hmm. black hats. They're Europeans. They're Khazars. So even us Israelites, you got Israelites just opening up. I'm gonna take you here to Sarah. I'm gonna take you to First Ezra. Slow down. Do you know who translated it? Do you know the Hebrew? You just can't open these books up and think you got something. That, that's the point we're bringing home here. Now, he's, he's coming at people who just blindly walk into a, a, a bookstore, open a book up, or oh, I can't buy that one, I gotta buy this one. And that's what we got Israelites and Christians doing. This assembly brought this book out, so I'm bringing it out, and now I'm teaching from it, or I'm gonna cut you with this, and you don't know the language barrier, you don't know the translator. This is, what, this is why we're pulling this out. You have to be Bereans and vet even the apocryphal books 
Just don't open up a book up and now you think you want to cut somebody. Read where we stop at, Op. Scripture to be scripture. Um, the first red line. And so it is evident that most of us receive certain books and reject others, not because we have personally evaluated them in any way, but because we trust that someone else has evaluated them and decided rightly concerning this matter, so that all scripture and nothing but scripture is between the covers of our Bibles. The question then becomes, who has made this decision, and are they really competent to decide for all of us? So that's what we're asking the Israelites as well as Christians. You open these Bibles up and says, this is scripture. I'm reading to you out the Bible. I'm giving you a verse out the Bible, and you're rejecting it. I'm rejecting it because you're, you're mishandling it because, A, you don't know how bad it was butchered, and, B, you don't know the Hebrew. Just because you're pulling, I tell you, we got Israelites and Christians playing Bible poker. Yeah, you quoted this verse. I see that verse, and I'm going to raise you this verse. No, let's be responsible with the text. Let's be true Bereans, and let's get some understanding. How do we get these books? How do we get these Bibles? Read on. When we go to the store, we find Bibles which have been published by publishers, of course, such as Nelson and Zondervan, but most of the publishers are connected with Christian organizations which have commissioned these versions. Say what? Are connected with what? Christian organization. So when you go to the Zondervan, Zondervan Bible Dictionary, the, di the definition of Alma, the definition of Alma is a girl of a marriageable age. It don't say, it don't say virgin. <coughs> Who gave you Zondervan? Christian organizations. Well, not only do they, re they reject in the Old Testament, so they reject in everything. They reject. So... <laughs> All your lexicons, all your dictionaries, everything we got, family, is being given to us by pagans. The term Christian don't mean good. We've been brainwashed because it's saying Christians, oh, it got to be holy. It, no, these Christians are, 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 are fronts for Jesuits. These Christian organizations are fronts for Jesuits, for Khazars. These Khazars are behind every institution of higher learning. So just because you get a lexicon or a Zondervan Bible dictionary, now you think you've got some understanding on ancient Hebrew words, slow down, slow down. Let's do a deeper study. Continue on out. Bible societies, church councils and associations and so forth these have arranged for certain books to be included or excluded according to the traditions of their member churches. These traditions go back to the founding fathers of the, of the denominations and ultimately to the ancient Catholic Church. To who? The ancient Catholic Church. So everything we're reading from, I don't care what it is, the Apocrypha, the Lexicons, everything we got, the Cipher, it's been handed to us by foreigners, by pagans. You just can't take it at face value. You open it up a lexicon and think you got the definition of a Hebrew word. Slow down. You've been given that lexicon by a stranger, by an enemy who don't know Hebrew. Just because you can read the word don't mean you know Hebrew. If you can't process that word from the pictures and get a concrete understanding, you don't know Hebrew. It's not being vain. That's the facts of the case. The pre-Mesoretic period. The Mesoretic text is not the oldest copy of the scriptures, and we just proved to you by 30 verses it's not the best copy. The Mesoretic text is a corrupted copy, and it's of the Talmudists, it's of the devils. Can we read this paragraph, Op? Yes, sir. The pre-Mesoretic period, the Masoretic text, the extent of Hebrew text of the Old Testament text is commonly called the Masoretic to distinguish it from the text of the ancient versions as well as from the Hebrew text of former ages. This Masoretic text does not present the original form. Say what? This Masoretic text does not present the original form. Can you read that again? Uh? This Masoretic text does not present the original form. So when you come to me and you trying to debate me or you trying to prove me wrong and you using a Masoretic text, 
That's any copy, pretty much any copy out there now besides the Septuagint. The C first, the ESV, the NIV, pretty much all of the texts are based on the same codexes. So slow down and get some understanding. Can you read this again, Al? Uh, this Masoretic text. <clears throat> this Masoretic text does not present the original form, uh -huh. but a text with the a text which within a certain period was fixed by Jewish scholars. By who? Jewish scholars. By rabbinic Jews, by Talmudists who hate Messiah by non-messianics. So you're out here trying to debate people, think you're correcting people, think you're cutting people down with a corrupted text by Talmudists. Slow down, slow down. Fixed by Jewish scholars and as the correct and only authoritative one. When and how this official Masoretic text was fixed was formerly a matter of controversy. So they're not sure when these Masoretes finally got their stuff together. Read on. Especially during the 17th century. 17th century? What year is that in the pagan calendar? Is that like the 16th century? So always, always subtract one. So the 1700s is the 1600s. Like right now, we're in the year, what, 2021? So this is the 21st century. In the 1900s, we were in the 20th century. So you always subtract one from that little pagan count. So the 16th century is the, what is the 17th century? Uh -huh. The 17th century is the 1600s. We, we have been way out of Jerusalem by then. The 1600s, we're getting ready to go on slave ships. And these Masoretes just getting their stuff together. But this is the text you think you know. Read on. One party headed by the Buxtorfs, father and son, in the interest of the view of inspiration then prevalent held to the absolute completeness and infallibility and hence the exclusive value of the Masoretic text. What that sound like what we brought up last week? What did he say this, this book is? Uh, I know infallible, infallible? and the un, un inspired word of the in inerrant. Yeah. You run with this text is the word of God because this father and son duo of Boots tour, books, books tour, they brought it out. The Masoretes copy is infallible. These Talmudists, these, these rabbinic Jews, they knew what they were doing. So you're around here, Israelite and Christian, think you have understanding with corrupted texts. Read on. Uh, one they, they attributed it to Ezra and the men of the great synagogue. That's all you got to do. You're a pagan. And I'm poor. I can't afford to go to Jerusalem, but I'm a rich man. I come back to Rome or Greece, and I got a copy. This manuscript and says, Ezra copied this. And most of these pagans were illiterate. Even the priests. We got a, we got a, a book, All Praises Be to Abba Yah, who brought this out? I think Benaiah. I got it from Benaiah about the history in Spain. It says like, one or two of the Catholic priests were uh, literate. The other priest just got into his school, got trained. He told you what to say. So now you got illiterate men. This was this was written by Ezra. Ezra, Ezra was the one brought him back to Babylon. That's all. That's all these pagans doing. So you are Israelite Christian following pagan doctrine. Read on. They attributed it to Ezra and the men of the great synagogue who, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. You, once you miss the Holy Spirit, you got to believe me. The Holy Ghost told me that you was going to buy me a car. And he said, don't worry about the expense of it because God's going to bless you a hundredfold. <laughs> so now you're in front of the church. The Holy Spirit told me this. That's what they're saying about this text. Read on. We're supposed to have the purified were supposed to have purified the text from all acclimated error. Accumulated. So the Holy Spirit helped them correct all the errors. Are y'all going to go for that, family? Are y'all going to go for that? The Holy Spirit helped these men take out all the errors of the text. The devil. <laughs> <laughs> the devil. We just found 30 errors in your text. Not minor errors like in or of, we got big errors. Split the sun. 
We got major errors. The tribe of Judah is a lawgiver. We all going to be in for a shock when we when the most high get us back. We're going to be like, what? I didn't tell you to do that. All I wanted you to do was pray to me and believe in me. And y'all right here acting like robots because Captain said this. Rabbi said this. Oh, he wrote books. He, he know the Yiddish. Oh, he, he got 100,000 followers. So now you, you're a groupie of these YouTube stars. You're a groupie of these captains. Slow down, man. I'm tired of these people. Tired of these people, man. It's wartime for me. I don't care. It's why the Christian is wartime for me. Don't come for me if you're not studying and learning. I, my, my swords are sharp. It's wartime. It's wartime. We don't I, um, accumulated error. The Holy Spirit helped them fix the accumulated error. And they added the vowel points, the accents, and other punctuation marks. Thus, steadily the reading and pronunciation. The Holy Spirit helped them put the vowel points in there. Now, we said last week, when you put these vowel points in and you change the pronunciation, you're changing the text. You're changing the meaning. You're a violation of what? Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4 and 2. Do not change or add from my word. When you start translating our scrolls, you're weakening the Hebrew. So these Masoretic priests or devils, or devils. Read on. They fixed the canon and made it, <clears throat> and made it the made the right division into verses, paragraphs, and books. And finally, by the providence of God and the care of the Jews, the text thus made was believed to have been kept from all error and to present the veritable word of God. Veritable is a word meaning the true word. Veritable, uh, veritable means truth. We just went through. That's why we took that time, family. That's why we took the time. And we're not done, but we, we just put up 30 errors. And I got websites that I forgot about that, that's more. But this man, these pagans have pushed the Masoretic text to be the infallible word. Now, Dr. Simmerday goes and get a collar and get a little uh, certificate on his wall. I went to Moody. I went to this school. And now I'm telling you, this is the word of God. Yes, the Jews, the Jews reject the Messiah, but they knew not to play with the word of God. Why? Because you're telling me that? Because you're saying that? No, it's lies. Read on. This view of the text prevailed, especially when the Protestant Scholar scholasticism was at its height. When the Protestants really got their schools together, they just perpetuated it. Yes, them Jews did a good job. Yeah, I know they killed Messiah, but they didn't play with the God's word. They feared God enough to keep his word holy, and the Holy Spirit helped them pronunciate it and ascend it. Come on, man. It's foolishness, man. And may be designed as the orthodox Protestant position. It was opposed by another party headed by Jean Morin and Louis Capel, who, in the interest of pure his, historicity, mm -hmm. this is garbage language, I don't. or the anti Protestant polemics, polemics mm -hmm. combated these opinions. So these two men were like, oh, wait a minute here. I'm not, these two pages had enough sense to say, wait, we're not buying this. We gotta, we gotta uh, refute this mess. That's what's about to happen here. Maintain the later age of the Masoretic text and sought to vindicate value and usefulness for the old versions and other critical help. So these two men, Gene Warren and Louis Capel, was like, we're not drinking the Kool-Aid. We're going back and getting the older text of these Hebrew writings because y'all just started this mess in the 1600s. Y'all just got y'all versions solid and finalized in the 1600s. We got Hebrew writings and fragments going back to like 1-2 AD or BC, BCE. So that's what these two men are saying. We're not drinking a Kool-Aid. They fell. They fell into many errors in respect to the details of the history of the text and overrated the value of extra Masoretic critical helps. But their general view was supported by irresistible arguments and is now universally adopted. This view, instead of deriving the existing text from a gathering of inspired men in Ezra's time, 
assigns it to a much later date and quite different men. So these men was like, listen, that story about these Masoretic texts came from Ezra and his colleagues. That's garbage. It's proof that y'all copy came at a much um, more modern time than Ezra. Your texts don't go back to Ezra time. And just textual criticism proves this. So that's what these men brought out. Like, your whole Protestant movement that this Masoretic text is coming from Ezra and his and his and his uh, generation to so this false doctrine is lies. That's what they're bringing out. Is that in Ezra in the Bible? Um, the first Ezra about him writing the text when he came back from Babylon and they got the second temple together. He taught the people of the law again, and that's when it's not written that he rewrote the Torah. It's just assumed by many that he had the right things. Well, again. it says that in Second Ezra is why. Oh, well, no, it's First Ezra. Right. Okay. First yeah. No, I was, I, that's why I was asking because right. it was like that. I was thinking like, oh, it, we, it, yeah, it is in first. It's in the first. First Ezra says he wrote many books. Yeah. But the KJV says that he taught the people people the law once the Second Temple was resurrected. Uh, so we don't have no concrete witnesses that Ezra wrote the second copy. But textual criticism, like he was in charge of making sure they had a new copy of our our. our no, our the reason books. why I asked that because if it wasn't the case, then I'm like, well, I thought in my head I was thinking it said it in Second Ezra, but then they took that out. But I was I was reading the wrong one. It's First Ezra. I, I, if it's not on the next slide, I give you a spoiler alert. The way they know that the Masoretic text don't go back to Ezra time. It's all. The most size we feel in this, and some of these pagans, some of these pagans been had to research, but it's just that once you die, the powers that be would discredit your name. Well, like, oh, he was a quack, but no, he wasn't a quack. He was on to something. Like, like some pagans brought out that no, Jesus Christ is not God, and he's. But once you die, the powers that be discredit all your work and paint you as a kook. Like the one scientist who says the Earth is not round. I got his diagram, but soon he died. All his colleagues like, oh, he's a quack. This earth is, a you can't go against the Greeks. So I'm going to show you how they know that the Masoretic text does not go back to Ezra time. Uh, do we finish this up? It says, instead of absolute completeness, claims for it only a relative one with a higher value than other forms of the text. A glance at history of the text will show how this agreement has been brought about. Okay. Who behind enemy lines, family? I know this may be hard to read, um, but I give you the website. You can go to the original for yourself if the, if the text is not big enough. Uh, the veneration. Oh, attempts to fix the text. The veneration shown. Well, one second here. Attempts to fix the text. Now, family, I ain't the smartest man in the, in the uh, bunch here, but if there's nothing wrong with the text and it's been Holy Ghost expired, inspired, why do you have to attempt to fix it? Just ask questions. You just told me that these Masoretes were uh, covered by the Holy Spirit and, and their work was infallible, but now we've got to attempt to fix the text. Something ain't right. Let's read. The veneration shown for the canonical writings during this period naturally led to a greater care in the treatment of them and above all to per perception of the necessity of critical fixing the text. As soon as the ancient writings obtained canonical authority were used in divine service and became the standard doctrine in life, the necessity of having one standard text naturally asserted itself. So we got to unpack this, right? And we got to learn as, as children of Israel, even behind enemy lines, we have to learn how to filter their information that they're compiled for our benefit. So it says, as soon as the ancient text, as the ancient writings obtain canonical authority, what does canonical authority mean? Uh, pretty much order or um, pretty much uh, the main, like if it was a canon, it's the authority or the official version of something. And who, who speaks like that? Whose language is canonical? Greek. Um, later? Phoenician. Or, well, later. You was 
Who came after the Greeks? Rome. Rome. So this is context clues. Me as Berean, soon I see ancient writings obtain canonical authority, Rome's in charge. Mm. The Catholic Church is in charge. The Catholic Church is saying, this is canonical. This is authoritative. You have to, as a children, uh, as an Israelite, you have to be able to uh, um, extract the truth out of their lives, out of their lives. So Rome is not going to tell you what's good for divine service and what's the standard of their doctrine. Rome is in charge now, right? Read on the preparation. The preparation of such <clears throat> the preparation of such a text began with the law. The other two divisions, the prophets and the writings, became authoritative only in the course of centuries. And naturally, their texts did not receive attention in the earlier period. Mm, but what are we supposed to live by? The law. The law. So earlier than, than, than y'all Roman period, what was y'all living by then? You see how you got to watch these pagans? You got to, every word you got to dissect, family. It says, where we were we at? Naturally, their text uh, did not receive attention, attention in the earlier life. period. In the earlier period, you wasn't worried about the law. What are you, what, what are you living by? You see how you got to watch these people read on? However, criticism during that period was of little value. There is no doubt that faithful and correct copies existed, especially of such books that as were publicly read, but this could not prevent errors and mistakes from creeping into copies which were generally circulated. When Josephus and Philo speak of the great care bestowed by the Jews upon their sacred writings, this cannot be referred to earlier centuries as con and concerns more than concerns more the contents than the linguistic minitude or a minutia of a text. Again, we got to be Bereans because Philo and Josephus, well, I can't speak for Philo. Um, I don't want to uh, muddy Philo's name up, but I can speak with confidence that Josephus was a, rabb a rabbinical Jew. That means he, he, Josephus wasn't a messianic like you and I. Josephus just thought Jesus was a prophet. So, of course, jo Josephus is going to support the Mesoric's work. He's the grandson of these people. Philo was doing a Greek text, so I'm not sure about Philo, but having them stand or endorse the Mesoric's means nothing to you and I. They are rabbinic Jews. They, 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 you are Talmudist to me. Of course you're going to say this is good work because it's denying Messiah. So you got to vet everything, family. Read on. Um, for the earlier centuries, in the oldest critical documents, in the oldest critical documents, the Samaritan, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and the Septuagint, there is evidence about 500 to 100 BC to show that the manuscripts most approved and most widely diffused contain many verbal differences. Say what? I the manuscripts most approved and most widely diffused contain many verbal differences. Going back to 500 to 100 BC, there were many different copies of our writings going around and they contain many verbal differences. So by the time you get to the 16th century, I mean the 17th century, the 1600s, you mean to tell me these Mesorex got the perfect copy of the text? Come on, man. Let's let's be Bereans. Let's not be groupies indoctrinated by by YouTube stars and by your rabbi and your captives. Let's be Bereans. Let's seek Messiah. Let's seek Messiah in spirit and truth. And these variations and these variations are not to be changed, to be charged as was formerly done to carelessness or willfulness on the part of the Hellenistic Jews and Samaritans, but are explained by the lesser importance attached to the exact uniformity of the text 
and to the existence of mistakes in current copies. So it's saying you can't really blame them for making mistakes. Let's not just, let's not be finger pointing. It's just all these copies had different things. So it was really hard for them to get to know who got the true version. So he's, he, he's trying to be objective. Let's not just throw the Mazarites under the bus. It just, it was a bunch of bad copies going around and they did the best they could. That's, that's pretty much what he's making a case for. Read on. And when the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch agree in good writing, good readings, and still oftener in bad ones what? against the Masoretic text. Say, say this again, up. And when the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch agree in good readings, and still oftener in bad ones. So it's saying the Septuagint, which is a thousand years newer or older than the Masoretic, the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch. Samaritan Pentateuch is for northern Israel. They had a copy of the law. Pentateuch refers to the five books of Moses. So it's saying the Septuagint and the, and the Samaritan Pentateuch in good copies and even in the bad copies, they are corroborating and they disagree with the Masoretic text. What do we say about the plumb line? Two or, more two or more witnesses. So I'm going to go with the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch versus your Masoretic text. Let's be Bereans. Read on. It may be concluded that these readings were spread by many copies current among the Palestinian Jews and therefore not to be regarded as offensive. So the Israelites, that's what pa Palestinian Jews mean. The Israelites at that time, they were using them, so they wasn't offended that they, they had different writings. It's just like, okay, you got to copy the best copy you got, and you got this from this rabbi. So it, at this time, it wasn't an offense that you had different copies of the text. Read on. But after the destruction of Jerusalem, when Judaism was subject to the authority of the rabbis, it became possible to prepare a uniform standard text. Whoa, whoa, what is this saying? What is this saying? When Rome took over. And who got expelled? The real Jews. The Nazarites, the one who believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. And then the Talmudists who don't believe in Christ. I'm glad those, because remember, Nazarite was a star. So now the Talmudists is like, I'm glad those Nazarites, dirty scumbags, are out of here talking about that, that they wouldn't even say Jesus, talking about that Yahweh Shai character. Now that they're going to captivity, we can control the text in Jerusalem. We're going to X out everything that's talking about that Messiah character. That Yahweh Shai character, he's not the one. Let me change this to that. Let me change this to that. Now these are the fathers of the men. Uh, the Nazarites. Now that the Nazarites are gone, I don't have to argue with these Nazarites about me and my text. There's no one here to debate me. Mm -hmm. There's no one here to challenge me. These are the texts you're reading with this Masoretic text. You're reading their text. Read on. It became possible to pre prepare a uniform standard text. Although this idea was not realized until many generations had worked upon it. So remember, when did Rome take us out? 70 AD. 70 AD. When that last uh, last slide says that they really got their stuff together with their version, what century? 17. So 70 AD to 1600s. How many years is that? Like a 1500 years? Probably that 1260 they talk about in Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> you see how many years they got? Us Nazarites, we beat them because we didn't have no power, no money to, to pay Roman soldiers off. We're in the slave mines again, and the rabbis with money to pay them, hey, let me stay here. They got access to all the fragments of the temple. Now, no one can contend with them. They can edit that text now. Read on. Uh, the Greeks... The Greek version? The Greek version of the second century had already fewer variations from the Masoretic. Say what? The Greek versions of the second century had already fewer variations from the Masoretic. So even in the second century, the Greek versions had fewer variations than your Masoretic text. Read on. Still nearer to the latter text is the Hebrew text of Origen and Jerome. Mm-hmm. 
The Talmud itself bears witness by the agreement of its biblical quotations of the Masoretic text. The text was practically finished before the Talmudic era closed. So now they're relating. We know when we know when the Talmud was finished. The Talmud comes in two parts: the the um, the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah, I believe, was the first part. So it says we can pretty much get an idea when the Masoretic text was finished because the Talmud is quoting from the Masoretic text. That's all it's saying there. The Talmud itself bears, I mean, I'm sorry, it is not possible to say upon the principles the text was treated, but the way in which the, <clears throat> the custodians, the custodians' individuality of several authors, books, and periods is remarkable and proves that the intentional and arbitrary changes of the text were not made by these critics. How, what 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 changes? Arbitrary, changes. intentional, and arbitrary changes. So you they they're conceding some changes were intentional and some were arbitrary, meaning by just scribal error. I'm tired, or I didn't know that. Or I use a new word that the old Hebrew didn't didn't have a word. So they're admitting that their Masoretic text had changes. That's what we're driving home, family. The Masoretic text had changes. Read on. That they, that they changed passages for dogmatic, especially anti-Christian reasons, as, as has sometimes been asserted, has long ago been acknowledged to be a baseless accusation. So this is what I tell y'all, family, and I'm sorry if I get riled up. I just, I got Israelites and Christians that I'm trying to be civil with, I'm trying to be humble with, but these people make it hard to be civil with them when they come with their, their puffed up, arrogant attitude, like they know something and they haven't read what you read. But it's our job as doctors to, to, to give them medicine the best we can. Sometimes you gotta hold a child's throat back and give them the medicine for their own good. And I'm trying to avoid that, but these brothers, they, they make me bring the sword out. I'm, I'm trying to be a humble man and give them ointment. So let's read what he says. That 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 they change passages for dogmatic, especially for anti-Christian reasons, as as has sometimes been asserted, has long ago been acknowledged to be a baseless accusation. So the producer of this website, I just let you know, family, he's a Protestant, he's a reformer, he's a Lutheran meaning he followed Martin Luther's doctrine. And he's saying, he's trying to protect, he's trying to defend the Masoretes saying that all those accusations that they changed things to fit their doctrine, and especially that they changed things to make the text anti-Christian, it's been proved that that's a basic accusation. Now let's go to Psalms 40 and six. Let's go to Psalm 40 and six, and let's prove the owner of this website to be a liar. Psalms 40, verse 6. This is the one we skipped on the presentation on purpose. He says, to accuse them of changing all the text that's, that, that points to Christ, we prove that that's baseless. That's a lie. They didn't make the text anti-Christian or anti-Masonic or messianic. It's a lie. Ooh. Not, not Masonic, anti. He's saying they didn't change everything about Messiah in that text. That, that's an unfair uh, a charge against these Nazarenes, right? Psalms 40 and 6. Shemai? Shemai. Read. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Uh -huh. Mine ears hast thou opened. My ears hast thou what? Open. My ears hast thou what? Thou open. Sacrifice, read it again up. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Uh huh. Mine ears hast thou opened. My ears have, hast thou opened, right? Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. And he says, my ears have not opened. 
my ears have thou opened. So this man who's a Protestant, he's a follower of Martin Luther. He's defending these Masoretic priests saying these claims that they change verses to go against Messiah is false. And we've been proven false. Read that again in your Masoretic text. Op. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. This is what it really says in the Septuagint. Psalms 40 and 6. Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared. For, but a body has thou prepared. Whole burnt offering and sacrifices for sin thou did not require. Y'all see the difference? Y'all see the difference? Read it again. Read it again. Up. Oh, yeah. The mind, ears, thou hast opened. Mm -hmm. not, you know. There you go. It's saying that, um, well, yeah, yours is saying that he, he basically, it's basically saying for the Messiah, um, you did not want to sacrifice an offering, but you, what does yours say? But you prepared a. So Psalms 40 and 6 is a messianic verse, it points to Messiah. And it points to the one they hung up was the Messiah. So these Masoretic priests changed it, talk about you open my ears. But it really says, Psalms 40 and 6 in the Septuagint, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, meaning you didn't, you didn't want that, Father, but a body has thou prepared for me. Whole burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou did not require. You didn't want that. Verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I come in the value of the book. It is written concerning me. Who said that when he came? Yahweh Shah. Mm -hmm. So these Masoretic priests had to change their version because that, that was a dead giveaway. The one y'all hung on the tree, he was the Messiah. And this verse in Psalms 46 is talking about him. So when this white, when this man says that they didn't change messianic verses, they didn't make that text anti-Christian, they did. They did. So that's why I tell y'all, even these writings and these articles and these Dead Sea Scrolls, everything we got here, family, has been given to us by strangers. We, we're behind enemy lines. We got to go over, through everything with a fine tooth comb. But more importantly, we got to fast and pray and ask the Messiah to give us understanding. Just because you buy these books and you bought, you could buy a $1,500 book. If Messiah don't give you understanding, you just spent $1,500 for nothing. That's what we're trying to say, family. That's what we're driving home. You have to be Bereans. You have to seek the Father. Messiah has to give you understanding for you to understand what the Father said through these corrupted texts. Let's finish this up. We're done. Which part now? Uh, where they mention changes. Where they mention changes, they make clear than they follow the testimony of the manuscripts, the number, which was probably not very great. We just proved that to be a lie. They made clear that they followed the testimony of, of the manuscripts, the number of which was probably not very great. We just proved them to be a lie. They did not follow the manuscripts. You just said earlier there were very many fragments going around before Rome conquered the place. So which one is it? Was there few manuscripts or was there many manuscripts up to the Roman period? This man is writing his article to fit his doctrine, to fit his theology. That's why we got to vet everything with a fine tooth comb. We have to come back to our true inheritance of being Israelites. Seek Messiah to get this truth, family. Read on. The fact that in the first centuries after Christ, the text approximates our present Masoretic reading shows that a certain recension became authoritative, which was possible only after a certain manuscript had been taken as the norm. <laughs> of such a standard codex, copies could easily be made or one could correct his own copies in accordance with it. Scholars like Oshelon or Oshanson mm -hmm. and Lagarde speak therefore of some such archetype which was slavishly followed in every respect. The critical apparatus 
of the time is concealed in disassociated fragments in the later Mazara. Masora. Masora. Masora is the uh, Hebrew word for traditions. That's where we get uh, Masoretic uh, text from. These Masoras or these Masoretes follow Masora. Masora is a Hebrew word for traditions. Traditions. Who kept talking about the, the traditions of your father? Who kept talking about you follow the traditions of your father? Christ. Christ. So these Masora, these Masoretes are descendants of the Pharisees. The one Messiah kept not arguing with, he kept trying to help them. So you're reading a text of the descendants of the one who killed Messiah. That's what they're saying. And there was a later fragment after he finally got their stuff together. It was even some of their, their texts got fragmented. So you don't know the translator you got or, or, or the text you're reading. You don't know which version of the Mas Masoretic text you got. All this stuff is it's against us, man. We're behind enemy lines. That's why when you, you be having these debates with people, discussion, you pulling verses, he pulling verses. It's like y'all getting nowhere. And if you have all these deep questions and these deep, I don't understand. It says here, there. It says there, here, because you got defiled bread. Like the writer says, these people, you got Israelites and Christians trying to Bible thump you to death. I got a priest up here. I got a priest up there. It's all corrupted. As, unless you seek Messiah, you're not going to get understanding, family. Let's finish this up. Uh, Shalom, Chef. Uh, he said that Shabbat Shalom, Mashapah, I'm about to cut off, but I love you all. Shalom, Chef. We love you. Shalom, Sister Ray. Uh, where was that? Um, the critical apparatus, oh, we read that, the Talmud and other mirashim. Uh, the Talmud, the Talmud, and the older midrashim allow a little insight into the critical effects of the time. Efforts of the time. Efforts of the time. Thus, mention is made of the corrections of the scribes, of the removals of the scribes, meaning that in five passages a falsely introduced and was removed, and of the points in the Hebrew text over certain words to show that these words were critically suspected, such as the inverted none or noon, number X35, and the three kinds of reading. We'll just get that. Read but not written, written but not read, and read one away but written another, or read one way and written another. The, the three kinds of reading have, it is true, for the most part, only exegetical value or exegetical value. They give the usual instead of the unusual grammatical forms show where one must understand or omit a word or where the reader should use a euph euph euphemistic mm -hmm. expression for the course one in the text they are therefore scalia upon the text. It is possible that the reading or these readings are also fragments of the critical apparatus. However, this may be, it is evident that, the, that at that period, the text was fixed and that the matter in question concerned only subordinate details of the text. All this is proof, family, that you can't open these Bibles up at face value, especially if you have a Masoretic text. If you have a Masoretic text, you can't just open it up and say, see, it's right here that all men shall be saved. Or it says right here that, oh, they use the word virgin, and, and the Hebrew word virgin, Alma, doesn't mean a, a pure virgin. Slow down. We're behind enemy lines, and this is a, a mission this is textual criticism to get you to understand you can't rely on your carnal mind, you can't rely on your Greco-Roman education, and you can't rely on these tools that we have, dictionaries, lexicons, all kinds of Bibles out there. You can go to these bookstores, you can go to Amazon, 
And you can spend $5,000 on research. If you don't have the Messiah talking to you, giving you understanding, you're just going to be a sounding brass. So this, this is a mission for Christians and Israelites. You have to come back to the culture. You have to learn the original text. And what I mean by that, you have to learn the pictures. The pictures or the pictographs give the intent of the Hebrew speaker. Learn those uh, stick figure writings, and now you know the, the Hebrew word to speak is the bar. That's fine. You know that the Hebrew word to speak is the bar, but can you process what the bar means as an Israelite? That's, that's what we're saying. If you can't process the pictures, you really don't know Hebrew, you can't understand the text. So this is part two of textual criticism. We're telling people, we're, we're, we're pushing people into the arms of Messiah. We're not telling you to throw your Bibles away. We're pushing you towards Messiah. You need Hamashiach. You need Yahweh Shai to get true understanding in these last days to come back to be an Israelite. Stop challenging people. Stop debating people. When you don't know the Hebrew, you don't realize that the Masoretic text is corrupted, slow down. And with that, I yield for questions, comments, and concerns. Did we lose everybody? Uh, no, nah, they uh, just stay here. Uh, they just uh, silent. My only comment is just it just shows you how far removed we are from, you know, being restored and 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 being in our right standing with the Most High. That even the text that we do have, um, that's why um, Benaiah Israel always talks about you need the older books because the older the book is, the closer it is to the situation that we're talking about. Even my Septuagint, for the most part, is pretty good, but it's a lot of parts that have been changed. Some read and it reads the same, but some reads different than even the older Septuagint, um, not for the best. So the older books get you closer, but all in all, we can only imagine how much information we're lacking due to the fall and the drop of the ball of the Israelites and, I mean, Levites and uh, all 12 tribes as a whole. But I can just sit there and imagine when we go back into uh, the, to the wilderness and relearn. I think that's just why we need to pray for understanding before reading to make sure that, you know, we're getting the full content of the, what is trying to be said or, you know, because we pray and we're looking at something that's not right, you know, maybe ask ourselves or question something to deep to dig deeper, you know. Um, and, and that's that's the whole point of, the, of this series of uprooting Christianity and textual criticism. We're hoping to do good for the Israelite as well as the Christian, because um, none of us, none of us have it all, and none of us, you know or gurus, one of us are um, master teachers, and this is just to let everyone understand that, you know, you need Messiah, you know, I, like I said, I got Israelites as well as Christians, y'all see them on the social media, just swear they're killing it, and swear they got understanding, and, and they they were, they get emotional about their position, and it's like, once you don't see their position, then they start condescending and want to say this and that, and I can't believe that you believe that, and you mean to believe, tell me, no, don't, don't, don't start asking me these, these philosophical questions. Don't start giving me your logic. Just present your case and produce witnesses according to the pump, pump line, and I will filter your witnesses and make my own decision, because that's what we're going to do here at the Torah Group. We're never going to condescend anyone's positions. We're going to offer our witnesses if you don't see things our, our way, so be it. If that's your conviction, well, the Most High will, will honor you or he will correct you, but we're not going to force our position on you. That's not what I've been called to do. That's not my ministry and that's not my service. I'm going to present my witnesses and let you all decide for yourselves. And we don't all have to speak the same in here. As long as we all agree on the foundational principles that we are the people, the law is in effect, the, the first covenant is in effect, and Messiah is our king. He broke his body. We can keep trying to build and study about everything else. But again, 
This is just an effort for the nation, for the Christian as well as the Israelite. Practical criticism part two. I personally want guys to understand it. If there's no more questions or comments, we're going to stand inside the Bayat, face the, uh, the east, face Jerusalem, ask the right to, to pray over our congregation and bless the food. And we will fellowship family. The Zoom will be up for questions, comments. Why y'all? He said it right. He said it right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. Most I, was about to, I was about to go scramble somewhere real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm hungry. Go ahead, Ashley. y'all? Most high, how we come to you in the name of the only begotten Son, Yahweh Shah. We want to give you all glory, honor, and praise. We say goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Like Yahweh Shah, my Mashiach, we're going to like Yahweh Shah. We want to come to you and ask you to cleanse us from the inside, purify our hearts, circumcise the foreskin of our hearts. Let your law be in the frontlets of our eyes and be in our minds as we turn our face back towards you in all righteousness and truth. Let us learn how to serve you in spirit and truth through the Ruach of your son, Yahweh Shai, that you have sent here to comfort us. Let us be guided and led by your spirit that you have led our ancestors, uh, the righteous ways and the righteous ones. Uh, most high, we do want to ask that you forgive the sins of the forefathers who have broke your commandments and statutes and laws, who have led us into captivity. Um, and we just pray, most high, that you save us out of the hand of Babylon and, and all of the Israelites that scattered all 12 tribes around the world. We know that there's no salvation without your right hand, without your right arm, without you, your power and your glory. Most high, we're holding on to your words that say that the second exodus will be greater than the first. And we're praying and we're crying out and asking, most high, that you deliver us from evil and let your will be done in heaven, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Restore your name, restore your people. Let us be the head and no longer the tail because you said so and you have ordained from the beginning uh, before the earth was even made, you chose us. You chose us to be here this day, and we thank you so much for it. Let us continue to be led by the Holy Spirit most high. We want to say a blessing, and a, and we want to uh, say Yabarak to Gerald and his wife as they travel. Let them be led by the Spirit and not of their own volition. Let them be led by the Spirit on what to do, where to go, and where to be, and what to do as far as their next move. Bless Brother Chef, Brother Nahamya, as he's on his journey and continuing to try to find ways to spend time with his daughter and try to make a living while he's in Babylon to take care of himself and his family. Brett, bless Brother Yashaya, bless Brother Reggie, bless all of those whose name I may not mention, but they fellowship with us online or in person, near or far. Cover the house and bless the bayat. Protect us as we leave and move to and fro. Bless and cover the food. A special thank you to Wada to Miss Gina. Bless her for all her hard work and preparing the meal. Bless Brother Abijah for ministering to us and bringing your law forth uh, as your vessel, Most High. And just continue to bless all of us near and far. In the name of your son, Yahushai, the saints of Yah, say hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Yah. Hallelujah. Then we're about to feast up, but the mic is now open. Shalom, Montel. Shalom, Montel. Shalom.